Okay, here we are for philosophy of the paranormal again. Let's let some people in. I like Baby Yoda. All right, more people. Hi, everybody. Hello. How's it going? Pretty good. You? That's, that's good. Oh, the heat. I, the heat makes <laughs> things not go well. So hopefully uh, uh, for the duration of the lecture anyway, if you're watching live or if you're watching this later, hopefully you're doing it from someplace cool. Um, that's actually the reason why we are not having slides today. I was doing my prep and I thought, uh, with the heat, I said to myself, um, this feels too tedious today. Um, what we could instead do is do things more like a seminar, more like how I imagine things will go or how I want them to go for the class discussions at the end of the term, when we'll do like skepticism and belief change. Uh, but that's okay, because I still have my copy of the readings, which I've made some notes in uh, and uh, done some highlighting and so on and so forth. Um, and if you've never done a philosophy seminar before, let's kind of just like you get together and uh, you get together and you talk about the material and you critique it together. And I thought that that would be kind of fun rather than, um, you know, me just kind of like lecturing at you, even though we often have the opportunity to get some very interesting discussion going. Uh, I thought, hey, uh, why not use um, this heat and my inability to work in said heat uh, to just do something different? Um, I did this once in another class. I did this once in my philosophy of technology class, and it actually worked out um, just fine. So the topic of today is, of course, cryptozoology. And um, I, I decided, as I said before, to go for low-hanging fruit, right, Bigfoot, even though there are certainly, um, even though there are certainly other interesting creatures that you can read about, or, or cryptids, as they are called. Uh, now, since I don't have slides, um, I will, uh, oh, first I'll answer this question uh, from Josie. Okay. If at some point during this class for the essay proposal, um, yeah, actually, yeah, I could do that um, because, um, again, with this heat, uh, you know, it's tough to, to do a full three hours, I think. Um, so we'll go as far as we can with this cryptozoology material. And then toward the end of the class, I'd be happy to talk a little bit about the assignment. Now, keep in mind, I am probably going to be doing a video uh, a little 15, 20 minute video that I'll just post um, separate from all of the uh, all of the lectures and stuff. And that will detail um, the details, as it were. I'll tell you everything you need to know about the proposal. Uh, so so we have quiz number two coming up, which will be same as quiz number one. I'll probably open that up on Friday or so. Keep it open over the weekend, just like last time. And uh uh, and then after that, I believe, is when the essay topic proposal will be due. So, uh, yeah, I will produce a video for you um, for this weekend. And at the end of class, I'll give you some examples of previous topics. Um, yeah, if there's time, if there's time. Otherwise, perhaps I can just post the answer key. Uh, but we should have time to go through this. Speaking of quiz number one, a couple of students uh, did notice that I made a typo. Uh, so Jean-Francois noticed, I think, and Daniel noticed. Uh, Daniel actually sent to me, uh, is this a Freudian slip or something? <laughs> because uh, I, I, uh, the answer was supposed to be uh, metaphysical naturalism. Uh, I, I, I typed metaphysical uh, materialism. So, you know, a Freudian slip. When you say one thing and you mean your mother. Uh, so my bad, everyone. So uh, <laughs> uh, what else? There was some other news that I wanted to share. Oh, yes, um, about the second quiz. So um, students who are registered with the PMC, um, 
probably noticed a little, uh, some of you uh, may not have had the time you were supposed to get on the first quiz, and that's because Ventus was not working. Um, Ventus is the new portal where I'm able to see uh, who is a PMC registered student and what their accommodations are. So if you're not registered, you don't really need to worry about this. But if you're a student with uh, academic accommodations, this, this is important. So I only just got this sorted out today. So when quiz number one was up, uh, some of the PMC students contacted me and others didn't. So um, I apologize for the technical difficulty. I'm not exactly sure what the issue was. It took some coordination between the PMC and um, uh, like ITS, the uh, information technology people. So I don't know what exactly the problem was, but it has been fixed. So everything will be in order for the next quiz. But I do apologize uh, for the first quiz, and I hope that did not affect your performance uh, on the quiz. If any PMC students who um, didn't contact me earlier, you want to get in touch with me uh, and be like, oh, yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't. Uh, uh, maybe you also didn't realize that there were issues with Ventus and your accommodations weren't set up. So I apologize for that. And if you want to work something out, if this affected your performance or you want to talk about this, just come and just send me a message after and we can discuss it, you know, keep everything confidential, of course. Uh, yes, uh, Alexis, absolutely. Yeah, take notes, use those for studying as always. Um, uh, it's, it's especially good to take notes during a seminar because oftentimes there aren't slides, right? Um, so um, even though this video will be uploaded to the YouTube channel after, it's good to write down uh, what you think is important and then review it after the lecture and try and connect it, right? Like, remember, we're trying to get those neurons firing together so they wire together, right? So uh, proper note taking is an excellent way to do that. Um, I think that's all of the housekeeping stuff uh, that I wanted to say, wanted to talk about. So cryptozoology, um, a long, long time ago, I think in the first iteration of this class, I did do a lecture on cryptozoology, but it was very scant. Um, we talked about the Ogopogo. The Ogopogo is a Canadian cryptid. Actually, there are a number of Canadian cryptids. A cryptid, which since we don't have a blackboard, let me spell it out in the chat, a cryptid, spell it right, a cryptid is, um, is any animal that is the subject of cryptozoological uh, research. Now, uh, are there actually cryptids? Probably not. And an important thing to know about cryptids um, is that oftentimes they are not even uh, their existence is not uh, presumed or hypothesized based on physical evidence. Oftentimes, as we'll see today, cryptids are actually appropriated from local folklore, and they may or may not be actual physical creatures in that original folklore. And uh, this was the case with the Ogopogo. The Ogopogo uh, Cryptid. Oh, Daniel spelled it right. Yeah, I spelled it wrong. Daniel spelled it right. Thanks, Daniel. <laughs> Little typo there. So yeah, just so, just so. Yeah, there. The, that's the right one. That's the right one with the exclamation point. Um, uh, and the the etymology there is uh, is interesting, right? So crypt. That's from an old Greek word that means kind of like hidden. Uh, it's the same, uh, it's the same etymology of words like cryptography, for example, right? Uh, when we hide things by encrypting them with a code. Or you can think of a crypt, just a just a crypt, like a like a grave. You know, that's also like, you know, a, a hidden place. You've been put away. So these creatures are are hidden as well or if they exist. Daniel, go ahead. Yeah, you mentioned that sort of, you know, the, the, the typical uh, cryptids that people are familiar with are sort of, um, 
in some sense uh, adopted or inspired by indigenous uh, folklore. Um, but would we would we also apply the term cryptid for like if someone said I want to go look for a leprechaun who's in Ireland, would that still be a cryptid? I think so. Um, uh, in a certain sense, um, it really depends uh, because as we'll see today, I mean, you might not think that, uh, okay, if I'm gonna go look for leprechauns, that's not cryptozoology because leprechauns are, are humanoid, right? Um, leprechauns are, I guess, supposed to be, I, I don't know if, if, if in Irish folklore, they're actually short. I don't think they are. Um, but they are humanoid nonetheless. So they're not a creature. But as we'll see today, this exact same thing happened with Bigfoot. The original Sasquatch was not a big hairy ape. It was uh, basically just a legendary uh, giant community of like uh, Native Americans uh, who were just giants. That's, that's how it started. Uh, at least that's how it started when it entered, uh, you know, like discussion amongst, um, you know, well, uh, for lack of a better term, the white people <laughs> who were around uh, talking to the First Nation communities. We'll see this today. Um, uh, but uh, that it's interesting that you bring that up because another related uh, idea is that um, living fossils uh, are cryptids, which I disagree with, right? So uh, living fossil, what, what the heck is a living fossil? Anybody want, anybody know? Anyone want to take a stab at that? Get, maybe give an example. I want to just shout out birds and alligators. Somebody said sharks, good guess. Those are all good guesses, yeah. Right. Um, because, uh, well, everybody knows birds are just dinosaurs, right? So, um, and I love how the science, <laughs> I love how the science has come around on this, right? When I was a little guy growing up uh, in, in, uh, in science class, it was birds evolved from dinosaurs, right? And I'm like, yeah, of course, I, it makes sense to me. Uh, but now uh, birds are just dinosaurs. Birds are just avian dinosaurs that survive. Uh, sharks have been around um, for hundreds of millions of years, right? So they're living, they're living fossils in a sense. And alligators, crocodiles, these are archosaurs. So these creatures, uh, they're not dinosaurs, but they were around at the same time as the dinosaurs were, and they survived the mass extinction event that killed the non-avian dinosaurs. So those are all very good guesses. I would say that, yeah, in, in many respects, all of those do count as living fossils. Uh, but, a, but the best example of a living fossil would be something that we only knew from the fossil record. Uh, and then we found out it was still alive. And um, my favorite example is the coelacanth. The coelacanth is a type of lobe-finned fish that we only knew from the fossil record until the early 20th century where they started to be caught. Uh, now these fish live in very deep water. Um, so they're, you know, it, it wasn't until recently that we even had the means to fish that deep uh, to catch them. And um, when one was caught, it was realized uh, that, oh boy, there are still extant species of coelacanth. We thought they were extinct, but they've been around this whole time. Yeah, Jean-Francois, thank you. That, it is a funny sound, a funny, a funny word to spell. So that's the coelacanth. Are jellyfish living fossils? I mean, it depends, right? This, this is what the whole question of living fossil kind of um, centers around, is that if we know something from the fossil record and then we go and find a specimen of it still living, um, how, uh, how much has the living specimen changed? How much has it evolved from the original, uh, say, type that we know from the fossil record? And in the case of the coelacanth, uh, not much, right? There have been some changes, but not much. Um, the exact same thing can be said for sharks, for, for crocodiles and alligators. Um, not much, 
they have not changed much. They've changed a bit. Maybe they've gotten a little bit smaller. Uh, you know, for example, there used to be in the uh, in the oceans, uh, I think 30 to 60 million years ago, you had Megalodon, right? The really big shark. You know, they made that movie where Jason Statham has to fight the shark. Um, I never saw it, but I, I probably should. It sounds like a good time. Um, so that's Megalodon, right? And Megalodon looked like, uh, oh, Dahlia recommends. Okay, I'm going to check it out. Uh, Megalodon looked a lot like a great white shark, uh, but it was much bigger. Um, nowadays, of course, we still have great whites, but we don't have Megalodon, probably because some of the larger animals Megalodon would have preyed on uh, disappeared too, right? So Megalodon went extinct. But if we found that uh, there was still a megalodon out there, that might be, uh, maybe some cryptozoologists would be excited about that. So there's, um, so I would say that cryptid best serves as a label for um, uh, creatures which are sort of inspired by folklore um, rather than living fossils. Because we found living fossils, and real scientists have found living fossils, right? It's, we've got many examples now. You know, just because we found a coelacanth, though, does that mean there's a megalodon somewhere in the ocean or the Loch Ness Monster? No, no, it probably doesn't. But one of the things that you do see from cryptozoologists is an attempt to fit these folkloric tales into sort of what looked like scientifically plausible accounts really they're pseudoscientific i think but one example for bigfoot would be to argue that bigfoot is actually um an example of a species called gigantopithecus which was a large ape a large great ape that lived um thousands of years ago um and and so they'll say that oh maybe there maybe the gigantopithecus still exists and that's bigfoot but the evidence is not good just a couple other examples before we get to Bigfoot specifically. Um, of course, there are uh, lots of legends of monsters out there, uh, not just Bigfoot. And one of my favorites growing up, because this is something that happened within my lifetime, is the giant squid, right? Uh, for, for, for years, sailors had stories of monsters of, you know, under, the, under the depths of the ocean, right? Which, of course, like the ocean is, it's the ocean. You know, you don't know what's down there. It's pretty scary. So there were legends of uh, creatures, you know, uh, the Leviathan from the Bible, right? Um, the, the Kraken, uh, giant sea monster, right? Lots of examples. And people would say, because sailors are a superstitious bunch, they actually are. Uh, and I know my grandfather was a sailor. He sailed in the um, he sailed in the merchant navy in the in the Second World War when he was a teenager, uh, crossing the ocean, uh, uh, you know, uh, slipping in and out of those wolf packs with those U boats, right? So, uh, you know, uh, I know sailors. And um, some sailors are very superstitious. So you'd hear maybe a tall tale um, and think that, uh, oh, uh, maybe it's nonsense, but maybe there's something out there because the ocean is a deep, dark place. And for years, we, we thought giant squids were just nonsense. Uh, but there was evidence for them, indirect evidence. Um, the sperm whale, which is the largest of the toothed whales. It looks like Moby Dick. It's that one with the flat head, you know, the big, long, big giant whales, right? Now, these whales dive very deep into the ocean and they feed primarily on mollusks. So they're going after squids, octopus, nautilus, stuff that lives way down deep in the ocean. And uh, whalers would sometimes find these giant beaks, the beaks of the giant squid in their stomachs. Also, they would find evidence of uh, fights uh, by finding these scars on the whales that were the, the scars left from the suckers on the shrimp's tentacles. So when I was a little kid, that was the only evidence we had for giant squid was indirect evidence. 
but actually fairly recently a giant squid was actually filmed a live one was filmed by a japanese diving crew and there's a documentary about it that uh you can check out uh which i believe is available for free on youtube um and of course there were some specimens in the interim that had washed up so it, it was interesting for a while it was just tall tales indirect evidence dead specimens and then finally proof of a living giant squid which are impressive animals their tentacles can be like 30 or 40 feet long it's really neat um same with mermaids i mean there have been um stories of mermaids since antiquity and uh mermaids are um at least in the age of exploration people would see sea creatures like manatees and dugons uh and and mistake them for mermaids um so there's there's some more examples of uh how confusing this can all be right you have cryptids directly from folklore which i think are cryptids properly conceived um you have living fossils um you have the sort of mysterious creatures that you have indirect evidence for um and then you have actual creatures that you know it's kind of like a backwards cryptid where instead of taking a creature from folklore and trying to find a scientifically plausible account uh you see something that's natural some some just some animal and associate it with um something from folklore like mermaids so um so there's a little bit about cryptozoology um i decided to do bigfoot rather than the ogopogo though because there's a lot more out there on bigfoot um uh but as i said ogopogo is not the only canadian cryptid uh ogopogo is um is, is based on um it's really i think drawn from a from a spirit uh from the from the folklore of the indigenous people that live in british columbia i i forget the exact area um but there's also uh reported to be a monster in lake champlain um so you know lake champlain uh probably a bit of a touristy area right uh it was on the route of like Jacques Cartier and Samuel Champlain and all those early uh, French explorers. Uh, they, they came to Canada or what would be Canada. And they met up with the uh, First Nations and uh, they started exploring and trading and uh, and uh, yeah, Champlain is well known for that. Um, but of course, Sasquatch is also, uh, I think you can argue, a Canadian cryptid uh because the origins of the sasquatch are actually in british columbia and we can take a look at that now uh, bigfoot is kind of an american term sasquatch is um sasquatch is the original uh the original term it's probably a corruption of uh of a of an indigenous word uh unfortunately the author of this chapter does not tell us what that word is but I just thought I'd highlight the important bits that I want to raise with you all uh, today. Uh, this this book by Loxton and Prothero is interesting because um, one of the authors is uh, is a skeptical investigator who used to uh, believe in cryptozoology when he was a little kid. You know, as many kids do, uh, reading those uh, strange tales and unexplained mysteries books. I even read some of those when I was younger, and they are quite compelling. So. A lot of kids, uh, I think, are are curious about Bigfoot, and uh, as he grew up, he became more skeptical. So he's not here to um, um, be antagonistic or provocative. Uh, he says, "I explain that cryptozoology is my first love. It was my youthful obsession uh, obsession with monster mysteries." that led me to the skeptical literature in the first place. And I've never lost my fondness for the topic. I don't think of myself as picking on cryptids, uh, but as making an all too rare effort to solve cryptological mysteries. And I like that because, um, I mean, people have these experiences. These are all anomalous experiences. People see things that they don't understand. Um, and I want to explain that, even if that explanation is not, that they saw what they think they saw, right? So um, it's great. The chapter starts out with uh, 
you know, getting the reader uh, oriented. Um, our author here uh, tells us about how he once found a Bigfoot track. Uh, this is, of course, when he was young. Um, his parents were silviculturalists, so they're taking care of trees, planting trees, and they're hanging out with lots of hippies. And uh, it's not uncommon for uh, for the adults to try and prank the kids. Uh, so, you know, I found a Bigfoot track, but now I don't think it was really Bigfoot. It was probably somebody having a laugh. Um, but, you know, uh, that's great. Um, it sounds like a really great... Uh, sounds like a really great way to spend your childhood actually running around in the forest and just exploring nature and stuff like that. So where did this idea of Bigfoot come from? And, and I'll tell you right away that um, as I was reading this, I was actually surprised. I didn't know any of this because I've, I've never covered Bigfoot in, in one of my classes before. But where did the legend of Bigfoot come from? And how has it changed? Uh, because uh, as the author asked, has the legend changed over time? Uh, oh boy, it has changed. Um, and that is, that's the most interesting thing about this entire, uh, this entire Bigfoot thing for me. So before we look at all of the evidence that cryptozoologists uh, uh, say that they have gathered for the existence of Bigfoot and other cryptids, Let's ask where the um, where the where the where the legend comes from. That's what the author does next. He starts off with a little bit about ogres. This might seem like an odd place to to begin. Uh, he points out that the field guide to Bigfoot and other mystery primates um, he describes as an odd but intriguing pro Sasquatch book. Um, Ooh, I'm glad you mentioned that. Let's get, we'll bring, let's get back to that in a moment. Uh, but the Wendigo, yeah, that's interesting. Um, so um, we have this book that uh, describes lots of humanoid creatures, including Sasquatch and the Yeti. And um, there, there are really, there are humanoid monsters all over, right? In, in I guess in um, like a Germanic language, like English, uh, we'll describe them as ogre. Ogre is, is etymologically related to orc. So orc and ogre are, are both kind of, they're both cognates of, of, uh, of the same, I don't know what it would have been, old, it would have been an old ancestor language of, uh, of English and, and German and, and Norse and all of those languages. Um, but, you know, like a giant, uh, a monster, a humanoid monster. And actually, in this book, they include Grendel from Beowulf. So, uh, uh, first of all, who's Grendel? Anybody read Beowulf? Oh, no. Daniel, go ahead. He was like a sort of an ogre slash troll monster that I think lived under the sea and Beowulf had to slay to protect this town. Yeah, exactly. Um, Grendel keeps attacking uh, the town where Beowulf lives and Beowulf has to slay Grendel. And then, uh, then I think after he has to fight Grendel's mother, um, who's also like a dragon or something. So, you know, old, old epic uh, poem. It takes place, I believe Beowulf is... Um, well, the poem is in Anglo-Saxon. It's actually the oldest complete poem in Anglo-Saxon that we have. Uh, but Beowulf himself um, is actually from uh, Jutland, which is modern day Denmark. Um, and this is because the Anglos and the Saxons and the Jutes, that's where they came from when they went to England. They migrated to the British Isles after the Romans had uh, pulled out of there. Um, uh, the dragon was later. Oh, okay. So, uh, yeah. Um, so, but lots of monsters in that story. Grendel, Grendel's mom, a dragon. But Grendel is, is treated as a mystery primate. What does the author say about this? Uh, this seems like an outrageous stretch. 
but it does help to spotlight an important truth. Fantastic tales of humanoid monsters, ogres, and wild men were common in almost all cultures for thousands of years before the emergence of a canonical portrait of Bigfoot. It is natural that giant lore should be a universal feature of human storytelling. After all, giants are the easiest monsters to imagine, bigger, stronger, and wilder versions of ourselves. And yeah, this is true. Every, every single culture has some kind of uh, giant or wild man uh, beast in their lore. And is it that because there are some kind of uh, giant creatures, giant humanoid creatures that really exist? Maybe not. Maybe it's more to do with psychology. I mean, remember how I said that if you wanted to understand, uh, for example, myth and folklore and art, Freud is a great place to go. Um, uh, and the reason why is I think that there are interesting psychological reasons why we imagine these creatures uh, and why these creatures are, are imagined in the way they are. Not all, I mean, just for example, uh, not only do uh, all cultures seem to have some kind of giant lore, but um, also dragons. Dragons are also very common. Um, I wonder why. I'm not exactly sure, uh, but I think there might be some interesting, uh, whatever the reasons are, they must be very interesting. So a lot of, um, a lot of um, Native American folklore features creatures like this um, that may or may not be corporeal, uh, yeah, yeah, like dragons or giant snake birds. And, and okay, so, and here's the interesting thing is how in the West, um, dragons are bad. You don't want a dragon. You have to fight a dragon. You have to slay the dragon. That sucks. Uh, like, um, like Jens mentions the Ring Trilogy, which is an old bit of Germanic folklore uh, where Sigurd has to fight the dragon Fafnir. Fafnir used to be a dwarf, um, but then he became a dragon. Um, so uh, you have to slay the dragon. Um, but in the East, dragons are lucky, right? Um, uh, like in China, uh, dragons are good luck. So uh, I, I, I really like um, I really like that. I, I, I think that's neat. Uh, so dragons are kind of uh, magical and, and, and good luck, uh, symbols of good luck in some cultures, uh, but they're, uh, in others they represent monsters that need to be slain. So I think that's interesting. Um, so Native Americans uh, tell stories of ogres and wild men. This is, of course, common to all cultures and, and all of the uh, indigenous peoples of the Americas are, are of course, no exception to that. Um, some of these, like the Wendigo that Daniel mentioned, uh, they're non-corporeal, right? They're not, they're not believed to be physical, uh, natural beings. They're supernatural beings. Um, and some may be able to go back and forth. Uh, many, uh, many cultures, uh, including some Native American ones, have legends about shapeshifters, for example. So shapeshifters can change their shape. Um, so, uh, but how many of these are, how many of these are actually Bigfoot and how many are just, have nothing to do with Bigfoot at all, right? That's, that's the thing. Um, some Bigfoot enthusiasts link a lot of these old stories, these old, folkloric tales to Bigfoot, to our modern understanding of Bigfoot. Here there's a quote, the first Americans acknowledge these hairy races and their tales come down to us in the records that ethnographers, folklorists, and anthropologists have preserved in overlooked essays on hairy giants and myths. Examining these closely, a pattern begins to emerge of Bigfoot revealed. But this connection, uh, according to Loxton and Prothero, is, is, is a little bit spurious. Uh, what we're really doing or what a lot of these Bigfoot hunters are doing when they do this are kind of projecting back 
uh, onto uh, bits of folklore that really have nothing to do with the modern conception of Bigfoot. Um, one example here uh, is that Bigfooters uh, cite tales from Eastern North America uh, where the people have legends of um, man-eating giants whose bodies are covered with stones. Um, okay, so that's a giant humanoid monster, uh, but it's nothing to do with our modern conception of Bigfoot, which is supposed to be a big hairy primate, right? Uh, these are also cannibal wizards, apparently. Um, they eat people and they, they have magical powers. They can use talismans to, um, uh, to find humans. So these creatures are uh, linked, uh, or tales of these creatures are linked to Bigfoot by Bigfoot researchers, but th these creatures are, are, are clearly nothing like Bigfoot. So there are other human forms uh, humanoid monster forms that are linked by um, cryptozoologists to the modern conception of Bigfoot as a very tall, hairy primate, which are nothing like, once we read these accounts, they're nothing like uh, our modern conception of the Sasquatch. Um, so, okay, so there are underground dwarves or people described by the Tuana of the Skokomish River. So are those Sasquatches? Well, probably not. I mean, they're, they're underground dwarves. Dwarves, uh, uh, dwarves always live underground. That's, that's interesting too. The dwarves love to dig, whether you're talking about Tolkien or whether you're talking about um, old Norse stories, dwarves like to live underground. That's interesting. Wonder what they're doing down there. Um, the stone stealing wet cedar tree ogre. Um, or the soul stealing wet cedar tree ogre. Is that Bigfoot? Probably not. Uh, the giants, the uh, Quinault people of the Olympic Peninsula uh, describe giants that look almost the same as people. Are they Bigfoot? Well, uh, they don't sound very Bigfooty to me, especially because they have this six foot long spike growing out of their foot. And uh, as Ronald Olson, uh, deadpanned here. If a human is kicked with this, he will likely die. That doesn't sound like Bigfoot, right? So what seems to be happening is a, a little bit of cultural appropriation here. What we've got are Bigfoot enthusiasts and Bigfoot researchers uh, sort of going in and cherry picking, <clears throat> or not even cherry picking in some of these cases, but just, just straight up appropriating um, uh, folklore about humanoid monsters and saying oh that's evidence for bigfoot bigfoot is a large humanoid uh and these monsters uh from folklore are large humanoids therefore they're talking about bigfoot but they're not um uh they're not with uh th these creatures are all very different from bigfoot in their descriptions here right uh so that's a problem let's see um this bit reminded me of the Sandman, actually. Um, the cannibal ogress. Uh, let's, uh, oh, I have to move this. So we've got a cannibal ogress. Um, let's see. Uh, right. So the author tells us here that in the Pacific Northwest, um, people believed in some Sasquatch-like creatures, as well as this uh, cannibal ogress, um, which is displayed in that totem there. I'm, I'm not going to try and pronounce that because I'm going to not get it right. But this totem pole depicts, uh, let's see, a cannibal ogress depicted as Zunuk Wa, uh, carries children off in a basket, roasts them and eats them. So it reminded me of the Sandman uh, who takes children's eyes. Uh, reminds me of uh, the witch from Hansel and Gretel, right? Um, or the witch of the Dumuborgir, which I mentioned from Iceland, 
don't go to the Dimobor gear. Don't go to the Dark Towers because the witch will get you. Or in the Eastern Europe, there's the Baba Yaga, which um, if you've seen John Wick, all right, John Wick, they call John Wick the Baba Yaga, the boogeyman. Uh, Baba Yaga is, uh, is actually supposed to be female. Um, so that was a little bit of artistic license I think they took with that film. But the Baba Yaga is a lot like uh, a lot like the witch from Hansel and Gretel, uh, just a nasty cannibalistic uh, magical figure that lives separate from society and will cause children to disappear. Um, so, so this is sort of retrofitting. Right, um, an exercise in confirmation bias, as the author says here. Um, I'll just read verbatim. Bigfoot enthusiasts look back over native lore with an expectation of finding Bigfoot. They seize on any tales about a fabulous creature that resembles the Bigfoot they expected to find, while ignoring or reinterpreting the stories that do not. Then having projected a modern Bigfoot into disparate Native legends, enthusiasts make the circular argument that Native American traditions confirm the existence of Bigfoot. So this is a problem that we've got right off the bat, uh, is, is, um, is that there are biases at play amongst uh, Bigfoot researchers, and also we've got a little bit of cultural appropriation going on. Um, I think this is an interesting opportunity to talk about why appropriation is problematic because, I mean, this book uh, was published in 2013 uh, and that was before that term really entered um, the, um, I guess the every man's vocabulary, right? Uh, nowadays, uh, you know, uh, people know this term, they've heard it. Uh, when this book came out, this book, this word would not have been a part of everyday parlance. What is problematic about it and what is it? Is it just taking something and doing something different with it or is it something worse? Well, at least, oh, can you hear me right now? Yes, I can, yes. Okay, perfect. <laughs> at least this is something that quite common, unfortunately, that happens in a lot of different cultures, especially like given myself with like the black community. Um, of course, like you're saying, it's taking something from another culture and then using it as your kind of your own, but it's kind of in the, it's in the way it's done. And it, it's that it's not taking all the cultural values or the beliefs that are associated with it properly into another culture. It's kind of like being assimilated into a culture that isn't one yours and two, it's not being represented properly. And all of a sudden you know it's become like a really big thing in other cultures but it's not taken properly like out of it's like say taking something out of context and trying to make it your own but it's not correct you know like i'm not probably articulating it properly but it happens quite often in the black community so yeah i see what you're saying and certainly i've i've seen examples of it um uh a lot of it has to do uh the examples that i've seen um which are, I would say, that are more particular to the Black community would be the appropriation of music, um, clothing, and hairstyle, and even manner, even the vernacular, right? Like, um, uh, and, and why is that problematic? Because one of the reasons beyond all everything you said, like taking it out of the context, not appreciating the value that it has in its original context, uh, this one of the slimiest things for me is the idea that it's getting sold back to you, right? Like it's being taken and then it's, and then, hey, duh, and it's like, no, that was already ours, right? Um, so, uh, uh, so yeah, uh, you're right. Dahlia says the same thing in the chat, right? And, um, and in this case, it, it's, uh, yeah, yeah, like gentrifying culture. That's an interesting, yeah, that's an interesting way of putting it. I know that I, I'll, um, one example that a friend of mine, uh, a political scientist uses is, um, is yoga. 
not the yoga that you do, uh, you know, the yoga, if you go to a yoga class, I think that's fine. You're not evil for going to a yoga class, but, um, you know, yoga has an interesting story. There were yoga masters from India, like yogis from India, who came to the West and began spreading the practice of yoga, which was cool. You know, that's like, yeah, mindfulness would be another, uh, would be another one. Like if you get an app like Zen Mind, Zen Mind, I don't know if that's an actual app, but I mean, Zen, hey, that's from Zen Buddhism. That's a particular thing that Zen Buddhists try to, try to do that. That's their thing. Yeah, they do. Yeah. I, my mindfulness is just to do philosophy, honestly. Uh, I can't meditate. I can't sit and quiet my mind. I, I can't do that. I can't, I just can't. You got to do philosophy, play guitar, play chess. That's how you do it. Um, so, okay. So with appropriation, um, so, so yoga, you know, it's interesting because in, in, in the, I think it was in like the sixties and seventies, a lot of yogis from India started to popularize yoga outside of India, but during the British Raj, okay. When what was now India and Pakistan and Bangladesh were all British India, you had uh, white British people uh appropriating yoga and then selling it back like oh i'm gonna I, i'll do a yoga class uh, you know like and that is 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 to me is really stands out uh as a as a as a particularly like just dirty nasty way to do it um now not there there is cultural exchange right like that's one thing but appropriation is generally, uh, like Alexis said, you're taking something out of the context without acknowledging that context or acknowledging what it means to the people that you've taken it from. And worse still, sometimes you're even selling it back to them, like those headdresses that people wear to concerts, you know, those Native American headdresses. A headdress is, uh, is like super important. Uh, I know that in the... Um, in, in Anishinaabek uh, cultures, for example, the headdress is, you know, that's something you get, uh, you know, because you're, you're like very well respected. It, it's not something you should be able to go to the store and buy, right? That's not what it's for. Um, and, 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 and it's being marketed by white people, like here, wear this headdress and go to a concert. And it's just like, ah, oh, come on, man. Yeah, you can find them in gift shops. It's, uh, it's really kind of gross. Like, I don't like it. Um, you know, uh, Jean-Francois, you've had your hand up forever. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, no worries. Yeah. Um, I just, uh, personal experience, I've seen both sides of that coin. And then again, like you said, the gift shop analogy, I have a friend who's in Navajo uh, down south in New Mexico, and they just, they totally capitalize on it. You know, they have their own little trinket shops and what have you, and they kind of play into it. I guess capitalism does some wonderful things to, you know, moral values and cultural yeah. views, right? Um, it's funny because I guess appropriation could be determined by, you know, the, the beholder, the subjective take on things. Like, we could look at, like, the movie All Dogs Go to Heaven, right? There's that, I don't know if you guys have seen that movie. There's, like, a little Spanish chihuahua plays into, like, basically every Latin American stereotype you can think of. Oh um, yeah. But, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Was it lambasted though? Actually, it was a perp like appreciated by the Latin community, and like they thought it was just a, a good kick. Like, it was a good fun. Yeah. Um, in uh, Quebec. I... Oh yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Um, in French too, like I see two sides of that with family in France as well as in Quebec. Uh, in Quebec, I think a lot of you know there's like the language police over there, and they're very stalwart about keeping <laughs> their French um so in france you know they don't care like they they're all about the evolution you know and oh, the yeah. acceptance of like new things um uh, i no agree and forever I, exactly i yeah. i yeah like i i mean i see what you're saying i don't want to say yeah. a lot i because i am like such an anglophone like i'm anglo-canadian uh i <laughs> i lived in quebec for a bit i tried my best okay. you know i would go to the yeah. store and you know i speak french and and of course they know so that, oh, that's okay. You don't have to speak French, you know. So I never learned yeah. French 
but uh, but now the language laws are changing there. Yeah, but you're right. I when I was in graduate school there uh, in residence, there were a bunch of uh, French students from France, and they came over and they were driving around Hull, uh, and they were like, they got back, they were laughing. It's like, what's so funny? And they were like, the stop signs all say arrête. And I'm like, well, what, what do they say in France? Like, they say stop, like. <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> you know, or so. Like, I, um, yeah, so I, I thought, talk to my, yeah. Yeah. They think that the French that we speak over here is, is very cute and mignon, as they say. Like, they, they don't call, they don't call shoes souliers. Souliers is like a very old, old, you know, term. Uh, they just call them shoes or kicks. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's very different. And it's it's cool because over there, people are just, are kind of more embracing and the fact that things change. C'est la vie. You know, that's yeah. it. So it's, um, and then, yeah, you're seeing that pull in the opposite direction in Quebec where they're trying to like, you know, solidify the walls and get like but, strong about it. And that's, yeah, yeah, I think, I think they are going to, uh, and without getting into politics, I think they are going a little bit too far that way because, um, but, but I do understand the, 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 the want to preserve the language because Quebec French is, is, is pretty cool. It is more closely connected to the French that would have been spoken in France you know, like 300 years ago. And then you've got like a little mix of Acadian French in there, which is even more endangered. Um, so like Dan says, yeah, no culture is forever, but language is so important that I think you have to strike the right balance. And I think uh, especially given, especially given the history, uh, you know, of, 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 of the British treatment of the French, um, after, I think it was after the, you know, it was after the Plains of Abraham, right, which was part of the Seven Years' War, which, um, surprise, didn't last seven years. Oh, am I frozen? I look like I'm frozen here. Oh, gosh, it was just too hot. Oh, he's back. Okay. Yeah, sorry, my yeah, internet. Back. Okay. What's going on with the internet here? Okay, sorry guys, uh, my internet cut out for a sec. Let me try and sort this out. Do I have something running? I think I might have something running, but... Okay, now I can see people moving. Okay, I think we're good. All right, I think we're good now. Uh, so yeah, um, so yeah, all of that's interesting. Um, yeah, everybody, I froze. Um, yeah, Dahlia, this is a really good point. Culture, uh, language, names, clothes. Um, and I think you need to strike a balance. Uh, but when it comes to appropriation, we have to be careful to distinguish between exchange and appropriation. Of course, the cultural exchange is normal. Um, so, for example, the pizza effect. Anybody, has anyone heard of the pizza effect? Pizza is totally different in Italy than it is here. Yeah. It's evolved. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's just naturally evolved. And nobody is trying to go back to Italy and say, uh, this Chicago deep dish is actually pizza and not yours. Uh, everybody just recognizes that pizza has kind of evolved. Um, but I think with Bigfoot, um, it's especially especially problematic to try and cherry pick through these native uh, uh, folklore stories uh, because oftentimes um, uh, in, in, in a lot of indigenous cultures, this knowledge is esoteric. Uh, it's it's for uh, the members of the tribe or the community, um, uh, and sometimes even for only certain members of a community who have gone through certain rites of passage. Um, so it's it's not for outsiders to know some of this stuff. So that's also why this is a little, you know, uh, it, it's a little shady to me, right? But with that in mind, we can appreciate where the Bigfoot myth sort of grew from. Uh, it does have its roots in some very specific stories uh, of the uh, indigenous people that live on the west coast of Canada. 
So in the 1920s in the Fraser Valley, this fellow, John W. Burns, coined reports of Sasquatch. Uh, he coined this term as an anglicization of the word that was spoken by the, uh, let's see, the Halcomalum language. It's in the Halcomalum language of the Coast Salish people. Um, so unfortunately, that original word is not given here. So even the word Sasquatch is, is kind of a bastardization of, of, uh, of an actual word that unfortunately, I don't know what it is. Um, so there were these Sasquatches, these reports of Sasquatches. Um, but what were they like? They were actually quite different from how you probably think of Bigfoot now. Um, so this Burns fellow was a school teacher and a bureaucrat, and he worked on the reserve, um, kind of near Harrison Hot Springs. Um, they told, uh, the friends told him of these legends of giant people. And according to this author, persistent rumors led the writer to make dig diligent inquiries among old Indians. I mean, we don't, yeah, that's the other thing. This author is Canadian. We don't call them Indians. Uh, so, so I'm just going to say first nations, um, because we don't call them Indians. Um, also, why do the Americans still call them Indians? Like, that's weird. I don't know, man. I mean, we, we, we've known North America is not India for quite a while now. So just saying. So uh, he found these uh, accounts among uh, the elders. It sounds like it would have been the elders in the community um, of, of uh, men who had seen these hairy giants. So to us now, hairy giants sounds like Bigfoot, right? Oh, Dahlia, awesome. Seskek, Seskech. I'm not sure how that would be pronounced, but yeah, very good. Okay, thanks. Yeah, Daniel, I guess so, but um, I guess the underlying reasons, uh, you know, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know. If I were, I, I probably would want to be called a first a member of my community of whatever First Nations community. Um, but I'm not. So, uh, so okay. Uh, hairy giants. What does that sound like? Well, it, I guess hairy giant. If you picture a hairy giant, you might picture something that looks a bit like our modern um, picture of Bigfoot does, you know, an eight foot tall, very hairy, you know, kind of almost like Chewbacca from Star Wars, really. That's, that's how I imagine Bigfoot. But the eyewitnesses actually all describe uh, these giants as men. The Sasquatch with which Mr. Burns readers were familiar were basically giant Indians, giant indigenous folks although avoiding civilization they had clothes fire weapons and the like and lived in villages they were called hairy giants it is true but this was taken to mean they had long hair on their heads something along the lines of today's hippies so these were just giant wild people who were believed to live in the woods uh, with magical powers <laughs> uh well, yeah, I mean, hippies are all grandparents now at this at this at this point in time, right? So, um, here's an interesting account here where a fellow claimed to have accidentally shot a young Sasquatch. So he examined this injured boy, and then an older wild woman came, maybe his mother, and she had really long hair which fell down uh, to her waist. Um, uh, Victor was talking with this woman and uh, then she performed some magic and healed the boy and uh, and this, mel this man said because she spoke the Douglas tongue these creatures must be related to the Indian. I'm sorry about all the anachronistic um, modes of speech here everybody uh, but yeah that's another thing we don't really do. We don't put the definite article in front of uh, a description of a kind of person anymore uh you know it, it it does not sound good it makes everybody look it's othering it makes everybody look the same right like so we don't do that anymore um this one's the worst 
I, I, I put here, I, I, I think this is absolutely whitewashed by Burns. Um, he quotes a speech uh, that he says was given to a crowd of 2000 natives uh, from the Jahalis tribe. Um, to all who now hear, I, Chief Flying Eagle, say, Ugh, some white men have seen Sasquatch. Many Indians have seen Sasquatch and spoke to them. Sasquatch still live all around here. Uh, okay, I mean, that just sounds, uh, that sounds very whitewashed to me. That sounds like how Native American characters used to speak in old Westerns. Uh, that's not how people talk. Uh, but nevertheless, maybe there's a grain of truth that um, the people uh, in this community believe that there are Sasquatch out there. It's just that the Sasquatch are giant people. They're not giant apes or beasts. They are just really big humans with magical powers. So that's actually the original, um, th that's the origin, surprisingly. Uh, with, uh, and I did not know that prior to reading this book. Uh, so I find this fascinating. Uh, how, did, how did the change happen though? How did we go from giant person to animal? Well, it's, it's interesting. And it actually has to do uh, first with a rise in popularity of the idea of the Sasquatch and then purported sightings and also probably racism. <laughs> yeah, um, it's true. Uh, that's a really good point. The native peoples here are saying, oh yeah, they're Sasquatch. Um, they're, they're big magical people that live out there. So they, they're, they're just a race of giants uh, with powers. Um, but then the white people come along and say, it's an animal, it's a cryptid of some kind. So again, another problem with appropriation is that appropriation has a, a, you know, a, a, a big history of this too, uh, when we're appropriating stuff, right? So we don't want to be, uh, we don't want to appropriate stuff and we definitely don't want to be racist. So Harrison Hot Springs, where um, Burns had collected these reports of Sasquatch uh, in the late 1950s, um, were, they were trying to get some funding to help celebrate the centennial of British Columbia. So at that time, British Columbia as a province was only 100 years old and they could get $600, which in 1957 was a, was a good chunk of change, if they could propose a project. And their proposed project was a Sasquatch hunt. Now, um, this never, they never got their funding, um, but it blew up. This story kind of went viral. Uh, you know, it was like one of those viral news stories like before the internet. Um, Oh, okay. What's that? Uh, Wendigo a moment ago, and it suggested that similar attribution of animal features to the Wendigo was influenced by the European legends of werewolves. I suppose it's possible. I don't really know. I don't know enough about the Wendigo uh, to, to really say much about that. Uh, it's possible. Um, um, so uh, this was a this was a marketing hit. It uh, kind of put Harrison Hot Springs on the map. Like, oh, there's Sasquatch. You can come and um, come and hunt the Sasquatch. Um, uh, let's see. Um, even here, noting that this publicity was direct was directly boosting the restaurant and resort industry, the newspaper urged locals not to express skepticism about Sasquatches to the visitors. Uh, so they have the Sasquatch hunt. Uh, lots of people are coming uh, from all over the world. There were reporters um, uh, coming uh, and, and, and publishing their stories as far away as Sweden, India, New Zealand. Uh, so yeah, this really blew up. So they didn't get the, um, they didn't get their $600. Um, but it, but it almost didn't matter because they, because of the Sasquatch hunt, uh, they were, uh, awarding $5,000 to anyone who could bring in the hairy man alive. Uh, of course, you couldn't kidnap Bigfoot. You had to bring Bigfoot in uh, of his own free will. Um, 
So, uh, yeah, it was just kind of this perfect storm. Um, uh, oh, Wikipedia, yeah. You have to be careful with Wikipedia. Um, so, yeah, stories of Sasquatch in Harrison Hot Springs were spreading around the world, and there was a bounty offered to, to anyone who could uh, bring Bigfoot in. Um, <clears throat> and uh, this is where some of the first... Uh, you know, real famous Bigfoot hunters uh, really got started, like Rene Dahinden. Uh, he, he launched uh, an expedition to find Bigfoot in Harrison Hot Springs around this time, and, and he kept on looking for Bigfoot for the rest of his life. But there were already hoaxes happening at this point, uh, and, and hoaxes are uh, unfortunately something that uh, sort of pollutes the data, if you like. Um, one team uh, went in to uh, find Bigfoot, for example. Um, they ran into some problems. They were, uh, the, their, their routes were obstructed by rock slides. They had a rafting accident. Uh, so they weren't able to go and find Bigfoot. And when they got back, uh, they said, you know what? We were just going to fake some Bigfoot tracks uh, with these plywood feet. So, and plywood feet will come up over and over again throughout this chapter. All right, so, uh, but we're still talking about a humanoid Sasquatch uh, rather than an ape Sasquatch, right? Despite the silliness of much of the press coverage, this was a watershed moment for Sasquatch. As Dahinden put it, the widespread publicity appears to have been the genesis of the serious consideration that the Sasquatch might indeed be a creature of considerably more substance than myth. In the midst of the hubbub, John Burns, the original recorder of Sasquatch lore, returned to affirm that Sasquatches were large human beings. As the Vancouver Sun reported, Burns believes the Sasquatch originated in British Columbia and is of Salish descent. Various Indians he has talked to say Sasquatches they encountered speak the same language. So even uh, when Sasquatch was blowing up, Sasquatch was still thought of as a sort of giant magical human rather than an animal. But that changed thanks to William Rowe. William Rowe um, was uh, the man who first reported seeing Bigfoot and describing it as uh, a, a creature, an animal, a non-human animal, uh, rather than a, a giant human being. So um, before, before this, as I've highlighted here, all eyewitnesses um, eyewitness encounters describe Sasquatch as human in appearance, uh, wearing clothes, using tools, um, you know, uh, just, just doing things that humans do. But uh, William Rowe transformed the figure. Uh, this is a sketch that I believe was redrawn by Loxton uh, based on a sketch by John Green. Um, which was the guy who corresponded with Roe. Um, uh, he claims to have encountered a female Sasquatch about six feet tall, three feet wide. Um, I'll, I'll read you the, I'll read you the excerpt here. So this was a sworn statement that Roe gave to Green. Um, he describes uh, approaching this animal near Harrison Hot Springs. Um, this is what he said. My impression was of a huge man, about six feet tall, almost three feet wide, and probably weighing somewhere near 300 pounds. It was covered from head to foot with dark brown silver-tipped hair. But as I came closer, I saw its, by its breasts that it was female. Its arms were much thicker than a man's arms and longer, reaching almost to its knees. Its feet were broader proportionally than a man's, about five inches wide at the front and tapering to much thinner heels. When, I, when it walked, uh, it placed the heel of its foot down first, and I could see the gray-brown skin or hide on the soles of its feet. The head was higher at the back than at the front. The nose was broad and flat. The lips and chin protruded farther than its nose. But the hair that covered it, leaving bare only the parts of the face around its, the mouth, uh, nose, and ears, made it resemble an animal as much as a human. None of this hair, even on the back of its head, was longer than an inch. And its neck was also unhuman, thicker and shorter than any man's I'd ever seen. So this is the first time 
uh, the Bigfoot is described uh, here in 1955 as a as a as an animal uh, rather than just some human, some giant human. Uh, and and the author raises a very good point here. All Bigfoot lore kind of stands or falls on this account, right? Um, if Rose sighting is true then that is uh that makes it probably as the author says the most detailed and informative close range sighting of an undiscovered primate but if roe just made this up um then a shadow falls on every other reported bigfoot sighting since it's a bit like it's it's a similar phenomenon to to, to the uh, to gray aliens right uh, flying saucers and gray aliens. Everybody knows what a flying saucer looks like, and you're probably familiar with the idea of a gray alien from uh, science fiction, right? They have large heads, large black eyes. Uh, they're usually naked with grayish skin, right? They, sometimes they're just called the grays. Now, um, aliens like this uh, were featured in some of the first science fiction movies, and it was only after that happened uh, that people started giving descriptions of aliens during you know purported abductions and encounters that matched this uh conception of the alien that came from science fiction films the same thing seems to have happened here with bigfoot uh bigfoot is a giant human until he's not until he's an ape he's given a given an ape-like description and now all of a sudden when people see bigfoot they see an ape um so that's interesting uh, uh I, it it, it kind of makes me wonder whether the ape like bigfoot is a sort of meme in the same way that gray aliens are i don't mean an internet meme i mean an idea that just kind of spreads throughout a culture right a concept that kind of goes viral um but in any case you know if roe made this up then well, that means that a, a lot of Bigfoot research has to be thrown out. <clears throat> Let's move on. Here's the really interesting thing about Roe. Um, no one's, no one's like really, no one really knows anything about him, right? Looking into the case for a magazine feature in 2004, I noticed that all the sources seem to rely exclusively on the statement that Rose sent to Green, or worse, on secondhand sources who relied on Green. It began to dawn on me, no cryptozoologist had ever met Rowe. Uh, John Green had never met him. He had only corresponded with him. Uh, he had uh, moved, I think, uh, I think uh, Rowe had moved to Alberta. He was a real guy. He wasn't made up. Uh, but he never really talked to anybody. And unfortunately, he died um, before anybody could kind of talk to him in person about Bigfoot. Um, and there's a lot of details to that to that effect throughout the rest of this chapter. But that is uh, that is just so interesting to me. Um, a sworn statement and then we can't find the guy who made the sworn statement. So immediately that to me says, Either there is no guy who made a sworn statement and Green made it up, or the guy is, is a crank. Um, we know that he did exist. Roe was a real guy. Um, so was he just perhaps telling a tall tale? Uh, well, that's how it seems to me, right? Especially given that before Roe, the Sasquatch was not a giant hairy ape. It was a giant person, right? So... <laughs> that's a good one yeah well <laughs> oh, puns are great and also yeah maybe roe himself is the actual cryptid here like william roe who is william roe does he even exist um someone you know maybe has filmed him walking through the forest uh but uh but we don't know There was a Saturday Night Live bit that they did uh, just after just after the 2016 American election after Trump had won and 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 it was it wasn't finding Bigfoot it was finding Hillary Clinton. Um, 
because she had just kind of, you know, understandably, I think she she took a, a step away from the public eye for a bit after that election loss. And um, and so they're just guys out in the woods with cameras looking for Hillary Clinton. And, and of course, um, Kate McKinnon is just, you know, like doing the big foot walk dressed as Hillary Clinton. <laughs> it was a it was a funny sketch. I liked it. Um, so, you know, uh, another interesting thing about Bigfoot uh, or, or Sasquatch really is that for all this time, uh, and even though uh, tales of the humanoid uh, uh, version of Sasquatch had kind of reached um, various corners of the world, it was really, um, it was really uh, sort of, uh, I guess, to paraphrase the author's quaintly Canadian, it was a quaintly Canadian uh thing you know like the Loch Ness Monster is I guess a quaintly Scottish thing uh until 1958 um the Sasquatch would be rebranded as Bigfoot and Bigfoot blew up in the United States which is you know uh a thing that happens sometimes you know Canadians uh achieve success in America um you know uh Sasquatch, Bigfoot, same thing happened, apparently. And it all happened in Bluff Creek, California, in the late 50s. And it was due to um, a construction contractor named Raymond Wallace. Um, he would find tracks around construction sites where he was working. And these tracks, we know, are, 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 are probably, definitely, almost certainly fake. Um, uh this is how it went down uh a bulldozer operator named jerry crew had arrived at bluff creek um and he finds these he finds these giant footprints stamped around his machine uh he took them to be a prank um after that we get ivan sanderson who related nothing further happened for almost a month then once again these monstrous big feet appeared again overnight around the equipment around that time mr ray wallace the contractor returned from a business trip so no tracks for a while, and then Wallace gets back and there are tracks again. Every morning we find his footprints in the fresh earth we've moved the day before. Uh, crew made a plaster cast of one of the footprints. Uh, they took that to the newspaper, and um, the first newspapers in California carried the story, and then it got, began to be picked up nationally. So we had these casts of these big feet. Um, but they were faked by Wallace. Uh, after Wallace died in 2002, his family actually actually revealed one of the sets of uh, big wooden feet that he used. They were just like strap on plywood giant feet that you wear like snowshoes and walk around. Um, it's funny to picture him out there doing this um uh you know walking around with the giant wooden feet on i think um uh, and it must have really annoyed his co-workers too um but yeah this guy was a bit of a bit of a lifelong um shady character a bit of a bit of a uh a bit of a trickster so if a known bigfoot pants uh, a bigfoot prankster has his fingerprints all over a central case like this one why is, wasn't anybody in the Bigfoot, Bigfoot uh, research community talking about it, right? To this day, you will still get books on mysterious creatures and unexplained mysteries talking about these tracks without acknowledging that they are known hoaxes. And that's a problem, right? That's, that's a problem. We can't do science that way. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't especially long yeah, exactly. I was just going to say that that's that's what they that's what uh, that's what you do. You you can just trot a little bit. Or um, later in the chapter, there's another set of fake tracks uh, that appear to be going up a hill at a stride that no human could make. But it was revealed that it was actually a high school athlete who made these tracks. So we got somebody who's in pretty good shape. He had the shoes on backwards and he ran down the hill. So it looked like the tracks were going up the hill. So it's not hard to fake this stuff, right? So, yeah. Um, 
they Wallace had also uh, claimed to capture a live Sasquatch a few years later. Uh, he said he'd sell it to researchers for a million dollars, uh, but he never did. He dragged out the negotiations and he released the Sasquatch later. Apparently, the Sasquatch would only eat Kellogg's Frosted Flakes, um, which, <laughs> I mean, come on, like, smells su suspicious to me. Um, uh, yeah, just a joker, a, a trickster. Look, he says here, Bigfoot used to be very tame. Um, as I've seen him on almost every morning on the way to work, he would sit, uh, I would sit in my pickup and toss apples out of the window to him. He never did catch an apple with his shirt drop. And I just have this image of a guy in a Bigfoot suit trying to catch apples. Like, it's so stupid. But anyway, you know, it's fun. Like, it's, oh God. If, 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 I would say this is all quite harmless, except for the pack, the fact that people really believe it. Um, uh, anyway, um, so Wallace is, uh, implicated in these tracks. So we know he forged them. And as I mentioned a moment ago, books, uh, books either don't acknowledge that the tracks are fake or they don't even talk about Wallace or, or anything, which is really problematic. I mean, real books on science, when you have a case of when you have a case of fraud in science, you don't ignore it, right? Um, remember, I mentioned the... Uh... <laughs> yes, they should do that. Instead of finding Bigfoot, just... Just, I mean, if... Like, if you're gonna, if you're gonna hoax and you're gonna do a bad TV show, just get a guy in a gorilla suit and just go, like, full... Oh, we found Bigfoot. And make, like, a mockumentary out of it. You know, um, just just do that. Yeah, E.T., that he did love Reese's Pieces. That's true. Um, oh, man, Bigfoot. Uh, like, it's scientific fraud. Like, okay, like I mentioned a few weeks ago, uh, or, or maybe it was even last time, that the Andrew Wakefield scandal, right? Uh, the guy who uh, published the fraudulent data on the MMR vaccine causing autism. And um, it's not like this guy is never talked about, right? In, in medical circles and science, science circles. This guy is, is, your, is, is the go-to example of uh, like how to be a shitty scientist, um, you know? Uh, so real doctors, if they had not called him out or not discussed him, that would have been an affront to medical science, right? Um, because he, he straight up made that data up. He just straight up lied. Um, and not only was the paper retracted, but he lost his medical license. Rightly so. Um, man, what the heck is it that motivates a doctor to do this? I mean, you're a doctor, right? Uh, do no harm, right? You're, you're, you're supposed to be uh, non-maleficent and beneficent and compassionate. And how do you, I don't know. I, I, I really don't understand. Money. Yeah, money. Isaac is under because he falsified data. Yeah, hi, hence oh. Isaac. He's a, a personality psychologist. Yeah, that mm. like he's gotten a lot of his publishings retracted, and he's like a big name in personality psych uh, because he said that well, certain per personality types can cause cancer and heart disease. I mean, personality. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, personality psychology also is uh, is. Uh, it sure is an area of psychology. Yeah, I mean, personality psychology has given us such luminaries as Jordan Peterson. So um, there's, it's not really, uh, uh, look, uh, okay, so my, my background is cognitive psychology, right? Cognitive psychology is trying to be as scientific as, as it can. Personality psychology is still squarely rooted in Freud and Jung. Um, and, and, and it's not the kind of psychology I want to do. I mean, have you ever heard Jordan Peterson try and utter a coherent sentence? 
it doesn't happen. It doesn't exist. And now that his brain is, I mean, I don't know, probably Jordan Peterson's going to see this and sue me or something. I don't know, but they argue the personality affects health conditions. Like really like dysautonomia. I've never heard of that one, but how could personality, I mean, we don't even know what a personality trait is. These stable traits that are supposed to exist, uh, they, they, they don't exist. That, that's uh, like, anyway, anyway, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I'm just going to say, uh, if, if you're a personality psychologist, uh, I guess that doesn't mean you're uh, ethically unimpeachable as, as evidenced by this guy who took money from from the uh from the uh from the tobacco companies or 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 peterson who's just just such an awful person like he's just he just like it just sounds so like angry and hateful and awful and ugh. yeah well he rage quit that department recently because i don't know free speech free speech i can't be a transphobe at the university so i'm i quit like that that's that's it that's the long and short of it oh jordan peterson Ugh. anyway the less said about that guy the better um so uh a few bigfoot researchers are like oh hey hang on though uh maybe wallace uh Wallace uh, didn't uh, fake these tracks and you've only got prints for these tracks, but what about these tracks? These tracks were real. Well, th Wallace's family after his death did not possess every set of fake feet that he had, but they did possess some. And, uh, you know, it's a bit like our discussion with um, mediumship and, and, and claims of fraud and, and hoaxing with mediumship. Um, uh, if, if you find uh, one case of cheating, uh, should you assume that it's cheating? It's been cheating the whole time? Yeah, I'm inclined to say probably. Because I'd be willing to get to, to bet that that psychologist, I mean, it's not just one paper that he faked data in, right? It's probably a whole bunch, especially if he was getting that tobacco money. So um, just real quick, you know, I don't know. I, 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 uh, now, now this is sticking in my mind. I don't know what dysautonomia is. Um, what what is that? This will be the last. Um, I can say it. I'm sorry again. I'm in like a Starbucks class again, so you're gonna hear background noise. But no worries. Um, the it it's uh, the dysfunction of the autonomic nervous system. Oh. So it, it's really common in. Uh, adolescent girls so as many illnesses that are common in young women uh, it's blamed on mental illness or personality traits um if you look up like you'd have to look on more uh, what key reviews of like pain rehab programs like there's one at the mayo clinic in um, minnesota that frontwardly looks like a really great idea but it treats um organically physical illnesses as being able to be cured by like thinking your way through it huh um you just want to know more of a comment one like that wow that's uh interesting that's some what the bleep do we know type it's really of stuff. messed up yeah that is that is that's whoa that's that's quackery that sounds like quackery to me um i'm i mean i uh, sure yeah your attitude can be important your mindset can be important you want a healthy mind and a healthy body but um I mean, does it work like that? I don't know. And there's some aspects to it that are, there's some aspects to it that are totally true. Like it's talking about how if you have pain in a place where like you organically had an injury, but you no longer have that injury, but there's still pain. Mm -hmm. um, that's like nerves firing incorrectly. I don't know. I'm not the science person, but <laughs> the, it makes sense. But when there's like organic issues and you treat it the same way, it doesn't make sense at all. Yeah, it, it sounds like um, people in that study could be um, 
having to deal with pain they don't need to deal with just to try a treatment option that may not pan out because it's not rooted in anything. Uh, I guess we'll see. I mean, absolutely. Yeah. And that's why, I mean, you know, even if the study delivers a null result, there's still a question. There's still like an ethical question there, a research ethics question. Like, is it, is it okay to do this? Um, oh, it's not a study. It's a full-fledged program. I oh, full, when I oh the my God. Children's hospital, yeah, the Children's Hospital in Ottawa is trying to emulate as well. It's like well-reputed, but there's lots of reviews of, from oh. like people who have gone to the program saying that it, it's almost it's abusive. Wrong. Oh, man. Oh, see, that's why, that's why you got you to gotta really have your uh, baloney detection kit uh we're going to talk about that in our lecture on the importance of skepticism yeah we're going to read a little descartes and a little carl sagan uh and kind of compare and contrast and syn synthesize so that's going to be fun but oh wow that's really disappointing to hear all that um but this is why we do this it's harmless if it's bigfoot okay like you want to go hunt bigfoot whatever but like when it comes to like vaccines causing autism or using your personality to cure a disorder of the nervous system, uh, you know, people's lives uh, might hang in the balance. So, all right, look, uh, it's 4.05. Why don't we take a quick 10 minute break? Um, we'll come back at 4.15. And uh, I'm gonna have to skim through a lot of this. Uh, but I want to at least get to the, I want to at least get to the Patterson Gimlin film. Uh, and, uh, and then maybe we can just kind of chit chat about cryptozoology in general. Um, uh, if you've read either chapter one or chapter seven, maybe we can, we can, we can talk a little bit about some of those ideas too, but let's have a little break and, uh, come back at 4.15 and resume. So I'll be back everyone. Pause the recording. All right, uh, I think it's about time we resume. Uh, I'm gonna put my phone down. Uh, okay, so yeah, boy, really good discussion so far. Um, the, what am I doing? No, I don't need to go there, I need to go here. Uh, and I need to share my screen again. Then we can get started. Yes. There we go. All right. Uh, let's try and get to that film. <clears throat> so, so far we've been talking about the, 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 you know, what, what cryptids are or what they are believed to be by cryptozoologists. We've talked about that. We've talked about uh, a number of examples of those. We have seen how the original Bigfoot or original Sasquatch myth actually has it that Sasquatches are just giant people. They're just giant indigenous people with magic powers. Um, which, yeah, I mean, like we've said, uh, most cultures around the world have some kind of giant myth, right? Ogres, giants, um other kinds of creatures uh they're very common uh and it wasn't until the row sighting that bigfoot uh started to go from just giant human to non-human animal non-human primate uh so um we left off at the bluff creek uh hoax uh the tracks um that were cast by crew uh, were and um, uh, made by Wallace uh, were, were known, they're known hoaxes, right? Wallace's son years later would say to reporters, Ray L. Wallace was Bigfoot. The reality is Bigfoot just died um, this after uh, Wallace himself had died. And the author concurs. Um, uh, Glenn, Glenn Wallace uh, uh, was uh, Ray Wallace, sorry, <laughs> it's right there, was Bigfoot for all intents and purposes. Uh, but then we get to the Patterson-Gimlin film. 
oh, were the original Sasquatches seen as good or bad? I get the impression from Loxton and Prothero here that they were not seen as bad. Uh, I don't know what, whether they would have seen, uh, b- been seen as benevolent or, or beneficial, uh, but they certainly didn't seem to be evil. Um, it seems like they were just uh, like many, like many giants or many other folkloric creatures. Um, they may not be good or bad, um, but simply more powerful than people. And so people may fear them. Uh, but that does not necessarily mean that people believe that, uh, uh, say, the humanoid Sasquatch meant harm. After all, it was believed, the, the local people tell us, that it was uh, believed that the Sasquatch uh, had language and uh, tools and clothes and fire. And, you know, uh, the Sasquatch would have been the same sort of uh, being as uh, any other uh any other person living in, in, in that area at that time, just bigger and more magical, right? So I, I don't think that they were especially bad. I don't think they were seen as, I don't think they were looked at the same way that the uh, uh, readers of Beowulf will see Grendel, uh, for example. And, you know, yeah, some folkloric creatures are good, bad, neutral. Uh, it really depends. Um, what about the film, though? I'm sure you all uh, have seen or at least heard of the Patterson-Gimlin film. It's the fi- famous film that purports to show Bigfoot um, walking across a sort of uh, riverbed and turning and looking back at the camera. It was taken in the late 60s, and it's the most famous uh, sort of documentary evidence of Bigfoot. It was shot um, in the same region that uh, Wallace's construction site was located, where his uh, footprints were made. And um, yeah, very interesting. Um, the author says something interesting here too. Uh, he says, No one knows whether the film depicts a real Sasquatch or a man in a gorilla suit. Uh, Okay, I think we can be fairly confident that it was a man in a gorilla suit, but here's a still from the film. Um, Very interesting. It's looking back at the camera while walking away, um, just like uh, Roe described his Sasquatch. Uh, And if you look closely, um, you can even see here that it, it, it may even have uh, the breasts that Roe described and uh, was in the sketch of the Sasquatch that Roe made. So um, it kind of seems to me that the, that the film was almost, it, it could not have not been inspired by Roe's testimony. There are just too many similarities here. The way it's described as walking, its physical appearance, the fact that it looks back, um, and the fact that it, it may also be a female, uh, just as Roe claimed, um, owing to the an- anatomical uh, features of the creature. So, yeah, uh, it's just a little suspect to me. Um, also, it's a shaky, shaky 16 millimeter film that was taken in the late 60s. I mean, the video quality is obviously nowhere near what we would get today, which raises the question, you know, nowadays, everybody has a high definition camera in their pocket. Um, where's all the Bigfoot footage, right? Uh, this is the argument that uh, people who are skeptical of UFOs and ufology will make right? We have more cameras than ever, and they're better than ever, faster than ever. Where are all the UFOs? I mean, there are quite a few, uh, actually, as we'll see from uh, gun camera footage and stuff. We'll talk about that next week uh, in our lecture on aliens and UFOs. But if there are cryptids out there, there should be uh, there should be more photographic and video evidence, um, and really, this film to this day remains one of the only 
examples that uh, people are still somewhat uncertain about. More modern examples are uh, more easily debunked um, because video has gotten so much better. Um, but yeah, Loxton and Prothero say that, you know, this, this film is basically like a Rorschach in ink blot. Um, skeptics see, see it as obviously a man in a gorilla suit and believers say that it's obviously a non-human animal, some kind of non-human primate. So, yeah, uh, I don't know. What do we think? What do we think? If you have seen the Patterson-Gimlin film, first of all, I, I have seen that clip many times in many a documentary. You can find it on YouTube easily. Um, and it's very curious the way the creature walks. The creature also walks with a very rigid heel-toe kind of gait, which is, again, right out of Roe's uh, sworn testimony of Bigfoot. So another sort of uncanny similarity, uh, which suggests to me two things. Maybe Roe really did see a female Sasquatch who walked that way. And the filmmakers also saw a female Sasquatch walking in the same way. Or they simply used Roe's account to design their scenario and they had their man in the gorilla suit walking around. And um, yeah. <laughs> But Wookiees live on the planet Kashyyyk, so why would they be on Earth? Uh, you know, uh, although, yeah, Wookiees are great. Chewbacca, you know, my father, way back in the day, he actually met Peter Mayhew, uh, the man in the Chewbacca suit. Um, so I always thought that was cool. I'm, I'm one degree of separation away from Chewbacca. <laughs> uh, so that was cool. Um, but yeah. Um, let's see, uh, where was I going next? Uh, we, we, we are, I, I can't believe the time is flying by here. I, um, these, these points here just have to do with, um, the character of one of the, the filmmakers, Patterson. Patterson is, um, according to one man, no angel, a slapdash kind of guy that you wouldn't, you, you really shouldn't do business with. A used car salesman type of personality. So, okay, already that's a little suspect. Um, uh, let's see, he's ripped off uh, lots of people. He's had many a career. He was a, um, he was artistic, uh, an artistic hustler. He had been a stage acrobat, a uh, carny, an inventor, an illustrator, a Bigfoot sculptor, a self-published Bigfoot author, a semi-pro rodeo writer as well, uh, and, uh, and he was into show business schemes. He had courted Hollywood. Um, uh, one, uh, one other researcher, Rene uh, DeHinden, accused him of mail fraud. So he's a sketchy guy. Um, uh, doesn't pass the smell test. Um, now, that doesn't mean that the film is necessarily a fake. Um, yeah, I, I, well, that's what I want to stop. I want to I wanna ask two questions here. First of all, uh, Patterson seems like a shady character. Um, so what do we do with that? Like, what do, what, do we, what do we actually do with that? Do we say that clearly this film is fake because Patterson was a shady guy? Is that an ad hominem attack? Is that not legit to, to do that? Or, or, or no, is, is it legit to focus on the character of the person who is uh, one third of this film? Daniel, go ahead. I think it depends on whether you're saying, you're, whether you're restricting your claim to the film or, or saying something about like, you know, Bigfoot or Sasquatch in general, right? Like if you talk about the film, well, then you're basically talking about something that like you're basically talking about testimony, right? Something someone has told you, right? And, you know, when you talk about testimony, it's fair to sort of, you know, say like, you know, is this the kind of person that would give me honest testimony or not? And yes. if not, maybe I don't trust their te testimony. That doesn't mean that like, you know, what they're saying, like the, the thing they're talking about is actually false. It just means that, you know, you don't trust them in particular. Exactly. Uh, I, 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 I think I agree with that. 
Uh, but what does Alexis think? Alexis, go ahead. Yeah, I totally understand where everyone's coming from and their perspectives and everything. Um, and like you were saying, Daniel, it is kind of like testimony wise, like in a court of law, which is what we abide by in the adversarial system, at least, you know, you have testimony from a person and there's usually like character references and you're saying like, if this person is a credible witness to even be on the stand, all that kind of stuff based off their character. But then you also have to look at the other side too and saying that as we were just talking about it with different researchers, right? They people have their PhDs and yet they're still falsifying evidence to make yeah. a claim and saying that this evidence has been brought to light. So you can see how it weighs on both sides, how you, you trusting people is very difficult. You can't necessarily trust someone based off their credentials specifically. You can't trust someone just based off of sometimes their character because sure this person might be lying a lot in certain, in certain situations, but he might've recorded something that was true. I mean, I don't believe it is accurate. Like. I don't believe like it's actual footage of Bigfoot, but just because a person necessarily isn't credible doesn't mean that what they, they recorded isn't, but yeah. it does lay some credibility into saying, I don't necessarily trust this person though. So it's, you have to weigh it on both sides. I don't know, like, I can't really say, but there are, there's like both two sides to the coin here, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, I agree. I mean, there's something of the the the, the boy who cried wolf uh, about all of this, right? Of course, if you know that parable, you know, the kid is making a oh, wolf, wolf, and and uh, nobody believes him when there is an actual wolf. Um, and, uh, you know, whether he's dishonest or not doesn't change the fact that the actual wolf has showed up and is eating all the sheep. So um, I agree. I, I, I think that you uh, and I think like Alexis and Daniel kind of hit the nail on the head where, you know, what we're really interested in you know, I'm not saying it can't be Bigfoot because this guy is a scam artist. Uh, that would be ad hominem. But what I am doing is treating um, the film and the story, the story behind the film, really, as, as a sort of testimony, right? Like, I made this film. I filmed Bigfoot. Um, and in that case, you do have to consider how reliable the person giving you that testimony is. And if the person has a track record of being misleading, you're not assaulting their uh, character um, or assassinating their character to try and win an argument. You're pointing out that their character is not consistent with giving reliable testimony, right? But even if you say, whatever, look at the film itself, you know, uh, okay, we can do that. And it's not as clear cut as you would think. Uh, I, I, I do not believe that is a film of Bigfoot. Um, but uh, let's see, we'll get to the end of these uh, points here. Yeah, that, that's one thing. One of the points I skipped is Patterson made tons of money. He and that uh, Hieronymus fellow um, were touring around. Obviously, this is pre-internet, right? So they're going from town to town um uh showing this film and and making uh all this money just from going and exhibiting this film like a traveling salesman almost in uh in in, in these local theaters kind of reminds me of um you know you guys remember that episode of the simpsons where they get the monorail oh it's an old one it's an old one like seasons one to nine were so good and, and then it, it kind of sucks now but but there's one uh, uh, Marge versus the monorail when this shady salesman comes to town uh, to pitch them a monorail, you know, and he builds a really crappy monorail and then he gets the hell out of there. And, you know, this is this kind of thing, like show up and, hey, come and see the footage of the amazing Bigfoot. And then, uh, then you go and, and go somewhere else, right? So, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I know, right? <laughs> um yeah our our lt sucks I, I i wish it didn't i wish it didn't have those square wheels and it wasn't always derailing all the time and oh man yeah so um the next bit of evidence would have been the cripple foot fiasco which um uh, those tracks were found by Ivan Marx in the late 60s. And I'll just try and skip down to the uh, image. This is a footprint, uh, one of the cripple foot tracks. It's very curious looking. 
the idea is uh, is that some uh, Bigfoot uh, hunters and cryptozoologists say that you just couldn't fake this kind of track. I don't know about that. I mean, to me, it looks like the back half of a footprint and then the front of a handprint. I think he was walking in a weird way and, and just made the tracks that way. Uh, but these caused a bit of an uproar as well. Um, they had, um, they had uh, people arguing over whether they were fake or whether they were uh, from a real creature. It led to a sort of gold rush, as the author says here. Um, everyone involved in the search for Bigfoot descended on Bossburg, which is where this was, armed with everything from tranquilizer guns to aircraft. This stampede reached a fever pitch when a hoaxer, uh, hoaxer named Joe Metlow came forward with the claim to have a Sasquatch for sale. Um, this is a claim that happens from time to time. If you read the introduction or chapter one, you'll have read about the frozen Sasquatch specimen that uh, turned out just to be a fursuit. Um, so, yeah. Uh, just a lot of suspect, uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of things to be suspect about here. Uh, Marx just finds Bigfoot evidence with unbelievable regularity. It's like Patterson Gimlin, right? They said, we're going to go film Bigfoot. And then they did, which is just, okay, lucky. If, if that really was Bigfoot, lucky, right? I mean, like we said, there are creatures that do exist that uh, we didn't know existed until we caught them, like the coelacanth and the giant squid. We thought they may have just been legends or fossils and we caught them. And th th those things are incredibly rare. And Bigfoot, we we still don't have a type specimen. And yet people like Marx are finding Bigfoot tracks every time they go looking. It, it's just too suspicious. Um, so yeah, uh, he, had, he also had a Bigfoot film, Marx, uh, that it turns out that he had faked and we know he faked it. Um, this was figured out thanks to, uh, let's see, um, Peter Byrne, uh, who kind of financed Marx and his Bigfoot hunts, while at the same time he was out there also kind of looking into his fakery. Um, so that's very interesting. Um, yeah. Another... Uh, uh, another set of tracks was revealed to be a, uh, a, a hoax around the same time. Now, hoaxers, uh, I want to talk about hoaxers uh, because there is something mentioned here. Where is it? Carlos. They don't mention Carlos yet, but. So why would people hoax? I mean, so we, we've seen like either. Uh, so we have the original Bigfoot legends, which one thing I didn't mention about those was uh, is that. We don't know the extent to which, um, <clears throat> the extent to which, oh, what was his name? It's, it's escaped me now, but we don't know the extent to which, um, I have to go back and look. Burns, right. We don't know the extent to which Burns uh, and the uh, native peoples were, screwing with one another right we don't know if um if if sasquatch giant magical people is a thing that uh the salish people really believed or if it was just a kind of way that they were pranking the white guy we we, we don't know you know they might have been having him on and burns might have been like Oh, you're trying. Oh, I'll play along. Uh, you know, we don't know. They could have all been been fooling each other, or or just joking about with one another. We don't know. We really don't know, right? Uh, Daniel, go ahead. Uh, well, I was just gonna say on that, like the original reason I brought up the, the Wendigo thing was because um, I I believe I I heard once, and it was there was the, it was it was on youtube but it was this channel that talks about mythology and they talked about some indigenous mythology and there was a, a story and the protagonist was called onway the killer and basically the when 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 they go in the story were a tribe 
of people who were cannibals, but I believe they were also quite large. Hmm. So that's that's why I brought it up, is because I thought like it it sound it, I don't know it just kind of rung a bell for me the idea of like a giant sort of tribe of indigenous people that you know perhaps or perhaps not engaged in weird things. Oh, okay. I see. I did see. I did. I don't know very much about the 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 folklore around the Wendigo, so I didn't know that. Um, but uh, I, it could be. I mean, again, like myths about giants are pretty universal. Um, uh, and and you can find lots of examples all over the world, right? Um, so and who knows which are rooted in truth and which are inspired by. Uh, dreams or visions or or some something else right we we don't know which ones are meant to be sort of uh you know yeah so it's probably a little bit of both because you always have people that are you have priests you have the the medicine people um that are doing vision quests and talking to the spirits and uh you always have that and then you also have you know stuff that's meant to sort of teach you a lesson and sometimes it's both. So, yeah, I, I don't know. You would have to ask a folklorist. Uh, and unfortunately, I'm not one. So how do we filter all this evidence, right? I mean, first of all, I, well, well, Jean-Francois asked, asked a while ago, and guys, no judgment, okay? No judgment. But who thinks it's a person in a suit? And who thinks it may be a cryptid? I think it's probably a person in a suit. Um, and that's just because of the way that it, it moves. It moves like a person walking in a funny way to me. Um, so th th that's how it seems to me. But yeah, so, so Rebecca says person in the suit. If you think it may be a cryptid, like honestly, I'm not, I'm not here to, to, to be a jerk or, or make fun of anybody. Um, could it be? Uh, some kind of unidentified primate. I guess it could be. I just don't think, I just think that all of the other evidence is just too suspect, right? Yeah, that's another question. What is a Sasquatch? Is, that's a good, I, that's good actually that you raised that. Um, and yeah, an unsure animal would be so defensive and startled. Uh, who said that? Jean? Yeah, I agree. Who grew up? Who grew up in nature? Anybody? I did. I grew up in northern Ontario. Um, and before Thunder that, Bay we, area. Like sorry, Kenora, Kenora Thunder Bay. Or, Not that far. Uh, kind of okay. between, kind of between North Bay Sudbury. Like I went to high school outside oh. of Sudbury. Went to uh, oh. undergrad in North Bay. The pissing, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Rebecca grew up in the middle of a forest, so Rebecca's probably seen some animals. Uh, and Jean Francois, probably you as well, right? You've seen Inter bears, Manitoba, Inner Lake region, yeah, yeah. Okay, so, just so up north, yeah. yeah. So we know we know the woods, and um, uh, that's what you said. Yeah, I have never seen an animal, a, a wild animal, behave that way. Uh, wild animals do not look back at you when they're running away. They don't do that. They they might stop and look and then they'll leave or they'll face you and back away slowly. They don't, that's not animal behavior. Um, and uh, the ecological niche question, this is interesting. A lot of Bigfoot hunters and cryptozoologists say that um, the territory of Bigfoot overlaps with the territory of bears. Uh, and in North America, we're talking primarily about black bears and brown bears. Um, yes, we have polar bears, but they're, uh, they have a completely different ecological niche. So, you know, black bears, uh, I grew up uh, when I was about 10 years old or younger, when I was younger uh, in, in Ontario, there used to be the spring bear hunt. Um, hunters were allowed to hunt bears in the spring. And then they stopped that. And bear numbers went up, man. They went up like crazy. So I saw lots of black bears. Um, and the black bears are so cool. But no black bear ever behaved like that. Um, you know, bears often, when we'd see them, it would be from a vehicle. And they, they might watch us for a little bit. But eventually, they just kind of go away 
um, saw a lot of bears at the dump. I used to be a garbage man when I lived out there. And uh, actually, it was not a bad job because I got to see a lot of wildlife. And bears and garbage dumps, they're like this because there's so much to eat. So I, I saw so many bears. You'd see bears standing up and walking a little bit. But uh, yeah, it makes you wonder how many Sasquatch sightings, if their territory is supposed, or their, or their ecological, their habitat is supposed to overlap with the, that of bears, you've got to wonder how many Sasquatch sightings are bear sightings, right? Winnie the Pooh, yeah. I mean, bears like honey, but garbage is easier to find. And yes, that's right. That's right. Aren't you scared of them? Bears are more scared of you. Generally, they're more scared of you. The only time I don't want to be around a bear is if it's a mom with her cubs. Yeah. Um, so like if, if, you, if you see a bear with cubs, just give it a wide berth and uh, never run away. Okay. Never run away. Uh, because that triggers a prey, uh, prey response. Um, and bears can run faster than you can. So <laughs> yeah, polar bears are something else. That's my favorite bear. Yeah, yeah. Don't run, don't climb a tree, slowly back away. And if the bear charges you, you make yourself look enormous as you can. And you have to like give like you know, make a noise like a, like a howler monkey or, or, a, or a metal vocalist scare big and loud and you will scare the bear away. Um, but most bears that are by themselves don't want anything to do with you. They, they just, they'll, they will avoid you. They're not, they're not, um, I know they look cute, but, oh man, bears are just so awesome. Like literally awesome. They're so powerful. Uh, so bears, I respect bears. Um, uh, so that's where I was going here is that uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of um, Bigfoot sightings could just be bear sightings. And look, look at this. <laughs> Chances are the bear, like if you were to go, like say you go into a field, even around Ottawa, you're out, maybe you're out in the country around Ottawa, you go into a field You'll see a bear. The bear's going to be like way over there because you're not going to be in the thick of a forest or anything. And, and uh, you know, you'll see the bear. Bear will see you. And, and he'll probably just look at you for a few minutes and then keep going. Yeah, they, they do not care. Just don't screw with them, right? But uh, this was a really cool exercise because like all, a lot of you have not seen a bear in its natural habitat. So imagine if you saw a bear and um, maybe the viewing conditions weren't optimal. Maybe it was still obscured by some, some brush or some grass or some bushes. Maybe it's dark out and the light's shining off its eyes so that its eyes are doing that reflective eye thing that, that, that eyes do. Uh, and if it's standing up, I mean, that's going to look a lot like Bigfoot, right? Look at these two bears, right? These are two grizzly bears who are fighting. Um, they're when, when grizzly bears stand up, they're like six, seven, eight feet tall. They're as tall as, uh, Sasquatches are reported to be, and they can actually walk a short distance on their hind legs. And you should go find video. You can find video of bears doing this. And it's just weird because they look like people. Um, so I say a lot of Bigfoot sightings could also be bears, uh, some Bigfoot hunters say that um, even here is where uh, um, one of the authors talks about his experience as a shepherd, and he would misperceive things in nature all the time. Stump bears, they, they would say. There's even one uh, right here where um, Shepherd, another one of the shepherds was just, just happened to be named Shepherd. Um, she was napping in the bushes beside the sheep. Uh, she was awakened by a small commotion. Uh, and looked around to see a strange dog on the far side of the resting flock. Not stopping to wonder what a domestic dog would be doing in the remote wilderness, she charged through the bushes toward it, yelling and waving a stick. She burst through the brush and stopped, towering over her almost close enough to touch. Three grizzly bears stood up in surprise. Um, so that's also, if you see something and you don't know what it is, don't charge it. Um, 
uh, we don't have grizzly bears here, but we do have black bears and black bears are still pretty badass. They're not as large as grizzlies, um, but they're, they're bears. <laughs> so, you know, I wouldn't want to mess with one. So you can misperceive things all the time. And, and here is a, where uh, around this po uh, uh, point, I think is where the author also gives an account of when they saw um, uh, a stump that looked like Sasquatch. And then they, they, they all went and looked as a group and they found the actual stump. Uh, but if they hadn't gone and checked, uh, because of the way memory works, you know, memories can be altered simply by recalling them. Uh, memory traces change with every recollection. So you can actually get like false memories. Uh, and maybe you'll remember the next time you recall it, you'll remember seeing Bigfoot having moved when all the, all the while it was just a tree stump. <laughs> that's a good Getty. A, that's a Getty a problem about Sasquatch. <laughs> that's actually pretty good, Daniel. I might have to borrow that. Uh, that that's that's good. Um, here's uh, that's an interesting cast of the foot of one of the footprints uh, from Bluff Creek. So, um, you know, I don't know. To me, that doesn't look like a, a, a cast of a real footprint. It just looks too cartoonish. So, you know, there's that. And lastly, ah, here in the end is when they talk about type specimens, which is, I guess, the last thing I really wanted to get to. Because people will say, um, Bigfoot hunters rather, will say that what we need is, uh, we can, we can do some DNA tests. Uh, if we find some fur, um, even, even big hunter, Bigfoot hunters themselves are like, we can't really rely on DNA because we don't have confirmed Sasquatch DNA. If, if such a creature does exist, we don't have any samples. And even if we had DNA, usually the DNA we get is, uh, it can be anything from artificial fibers to animal hair just mixed with human hair. Um, so the problem comes down to a type specimen. We need a type specimen. This is how biologists identify new species. They don't do it with genetics. They do it with an actual physical specimen. So my favorite example of this is uh, the duck-billed platypus. You don't know the duck-billed platypus is a weird creature that lives in Australia. And it's a mammal, but it has a bill uh, and it has webbed feet and it lays eggs. Um, so, so imagine the first Europeans get to Australia. You know, the, the Aboriginal people obviously know about the platypus, but, but, but the Europeans don't. And uh, they send word back. They said, guys, you'll never believe it. There's this animal here that has the bill of a duck and the feet of a duck, but it's covered in fur like a beaver and it lives in the water and it lays eggs. What do you think the reaction to that was? They're like drawn and quartered. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever. They were, like, yeah. they were like, you're nuts. You're nuts. <laughs> so they're like, no, no, I have a specimen. And even the first specimens, they were like, this has to be fake. Somebody sewed this together. Right. Uh, but of course, now we know, no, there are platypuses. They're real creatures. They're very weird creatures but we've seen them in the wild. We have type specimens. We know that the duck platypus is a real creature. This is what we need for Bigfoot. If Bigfoot is real, we need a type specimen because that's the only way that we're going to be able to identify uh, whether it's a new species or whether it's some kind of fraud, right? Because hairs can, hair samples can be faked. And even if it's real Bigfoot hair, we don't have other real Bigfoot hair to compare it to. So, and we also can't work out very many anatomical details from DNA, nor can we do so from footprints, even if, uh, you know, there are a lot of fake footprints as we've seen, but even if there were real ones, you can't really infer anatomical details from a footprint beyond like, you know, the length of the stride or, or something about the gait, right? So that's a problem. We need a type specimen and we just don't have one. Um, 
so I guess it really comes down to, you know, how likely is it that there is a, if, if you set aside the, the whole problem that the initial accounts uh, or initial popular accounts of Sasquatch were of a human or a human-like creature, uh, if you set that problem aside, how likely is it that there is a species of primate that's as large as the largest people are, or larger, living in North America? How likely is that? It can't be very likely. I mean, let's say it, say it has the same range as bears. Okay. Um, we see bears all the time, you know, maybe not if you live in the city, but if you, if you're like from where I'm from, you see bears all the time, you know, I've never seen a Sasquatch, you know, I've Just seen with the technology yeah. present too. Just fly a drone with an infrared camera. Just go look around. Exactly. You, know, you can't really miss too much. Like it's ridiculous. Like if we can film a squid, that's like, I don't know how many bar PSI down below the depths of the ocean. I don't know how we haven't found a Sasquatch. Exactly. You find axolotls, whatever, how to know how to pronounce those, those little. Yeah. Uh, those yeah. salamander things with the feathered yeah. gills. Like those are, <laughs> those are really neat. Uh, in one also... lake in Mexico. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. And we found, you know, and, and other living fossils that we didn't talk about, we talked about like hor horseshoe crabs are, are like, they look like they came right out of the Cambrian explosion, you know, um, but they're still alive. Um, even Daniel, lungfish, there are still Daniel, lungfish. We've geez. So yeah, it's- The lack crazy. of genetic diversity. That Daniel brings up a good point too, with the lack of genetic diversity. Mm -hmm. um, that would just, yeah, it'd be such an issue. Exactly. Um, and, and, and we know uh, the only plausible candidate would be Gigantopithecus, but Gigantopithecus went extinct years and years ago. And Gigantopithecus, um, you know, there's one paper that they talk about that was published in a sketchy journal uh, that argued that Bigfoot was actually um, a, uh, a, a sort of a hybrid between humans and other great apes. Um, like Gigantopithecus. Well, Gigantopithecus uh, is extinct, so that's problem number one. Uh, and even if it were alive, uh, you know, maybe maybe this interbreeding happened before the end of the last ice age or something. Well, okay, the problem is that we still can't breed with apes. We don't have the same number of chromosomes. So even if you, and, and for, for goodness sake, I have no idea why anybody would want to, but even if you successfully mated with an ape and uh, a pregnancy resulted, uh, that offspring would not be genetically viable. They would be like a mule, you know, like when a horse and a donkey have a baby, it's a mule, but it's sterile. Mules can't reproduce, right? So, uh, yeah, uh, I don't know how that's supposed to work. Um, the animal would have to be not a different type of great ape, like because humans are great apes. And then you've also got gorillas, um, uh, orangutans, common chimps and bonobo chimps. The two chimpanzees are the cl most closely related to us, then gorillas, then orangutans are the most distant. Um, we cannot breed with other apes, other great apes. So it would have to be a different kind of human. It would have to be like a Neanderthal uh, because Homo sapiens and Neanderthals did interbreed. We know that they did because some humans, some modern day humans have anatomic traits of Neanderthals. I have one. I have this little bump here. That's apparently a, a Neanderthal thing. So sometime way back in the day, I guess one of my ancestors got busy with a Neanderthal and, uh, and here we are. So it's more common in, 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 in certain ethnic groups, like, uh, you know, Europeans and Asians will tend to have a little bit of Neanderthal traits, uh, Neanderthal DNA. People from Sub-Saharan uh, Sub -Saharan Africa don't, uh, just because those populations of people uh, didn't leave Africa. I mean, well, today they've 
maybe some of them have left Africa and live somewhere else. But Neanderthals were living in Europe. And then when humans left Africa and began to migrate out, the ones that eventually would end up in Europe and Asia and the Middle East ran into some Neanderthals, but the populations that didn't, uh, didn't because there were no Neanderthals in Africa. But Neanderthals, uh, they were like another kind of human, uh, but they were not like Sasquatch. They were probably shorter than Homo sapiens. Um, they were very stocky, very robust. Um, and that was probably an adaptation to um, stay warm in harsh European winters. Um, uh, uh, Homo sapiens uh, never developed that. Homo sapiens lost their fur and, and made a lot of clothes. So it's interesting. But yeah, um, so it's not like something like that is completely out of the question, but did it happen with Bigfoot? Probably not. It's just so far, it's just so implausible and unlikely, right? So yeah, Neanderthal, that's right. Neanderthals did have larger brains, um, maybe less developed language centers. Yeah, that seems to be evidenced by the kinds of art that Neanderthals made versus the kinds of art that Homo sapiens made. Homo sapiens um, from, from the archaeological evidence that we have, if I'm not mistaken, it's currently believed that Homo sapiens were better at abstracting than Neanderthals were. But we don't know. I mean, Neanderthals may have already been on their way out. Um, uh, maybe we outcompeted them. Uh, or maybe Neanderthals died out slash interbred with people. And, uh, you know, we, we don't know. Um, but yes, they did have larger brains. Uh, whether they were smarter is another question. They probably were not. But um, yeah. So, you know, I guess that's, uh, that's it. Um, so, you know, um, Bigfoot, if you ask me, probably does not exist. But that doesn't mean that we should immediately dismiss claims of cryptids. I mean, maybe some cryptids turn out to be living fossils, and that's really cool, right? Or maybe there's interesting things that we can learn about human psychology, right? And that, that's why I think that, uh, as the authors say in the final chapter of this book, uh, when scientists don't engage with these kinds of claims, they really are doing a disservice to people because if people can't get the answers from scientists, they will get them from somebody, somebody who probably has the wrong answer or worse, someone who is just lying to you. So, you know, I think we should take these claims seriously. So I, 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 I suppose now is a good time to discuss questions uh, if, if anyone wants to know about the essay assignment or, or anything like that. I'll tell you what, if anyone has any particular questions, just go ahead and put your hand up and I'll sort of deal with them one at a time. Um, okay, Daniel, go ahead. For the quiz, will we be able to see like uh, a question by question, like breakdown of what, what marks we got? Um, does it not do that already, or or is is? Uh... It might just be because I'm on mobile. But when I went to go look at the on attempt little button, it just said like, "Oh, this is your mark." You know, it didn't oh. say like, "Here's each question." You know. Okay. Um, depending on how much. No, it time... might just be a mobile. Okay. Well, depending on how much time we have, I can go through the quiz and and tell just share the answers. Uh, oh, it doesn't, yeah, Galila says it doesn't show the answers. Okay, so I'll go through, we'll take five minutes and do that. Um, uh, ba, 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 ba. It, you can write, uh, for the, for, so for the essay, you're able to write about any topic through the course, yes. You can even write about other topics, um, uh, which gets me to, to this question. Um, so you can write about anything to do with the paranormal that you want. Um, absolutely anything. <laughs> oh God. Um, that ought to be interesting. Um, 
uh, you can write about any paranormal topic you wish. Um, <clears throat> uh, this uh, one approach that I that I highly recommend is that you try and take something that we actually haven't covered in this class, and then critically examine it, right? Um, and uh, I've had a lot of students do that um, with topics that we don't have uh, time to cover, but which nonetheless fit into that sort of paranormal, supernatural, unsolved mysteries kind of umbrella, right? So, uh, for example, I had a student um, write a paper on the Mandela effect. Um, so for those who don't know, the Mandela effect is this um, false memory sort of phenomenon that happens. I um, wonder if I can give you an example. Who's seen Star Wars, like the OG Star Wars? Yeah. Yeah, lots of people. You hope, yeah, yeah. E even if you haven't seen Star Wars, you know that iconic line that Darth Vader says to Luke. The sp uh, spoiler alert, by the way. What does what is that famous thing that Darth Darth Vader reveals to Luke in The Empire Strikes Back? Isn't Vader like another term for father? Yeah, the Vader father? is Dutch for father. Yeah, but but yeah, but but okay. what but what does he say? Look, I am your father. Well, that's yeah. what everybody Are seems to think. But no, he doesn't say, Luke, I am your father. He says, no, I am your father. No, I am your father. But everybody remembers, Luke, I am your father. That's the kind of thing the Mandela effect refers to, or those kinds of false memories. Another example would be, uh, has, has anyone seen that movie uh, Shazam starring Sinbad, where he plays a genie? Or maybe you remember seeing a trailer for it. I mean, I'm showing my age here. This would have been a 90s. You had to grow up in the 90s for this. Uh, so that movie doesn't exist. There is a movie called Kazam starring Shaquille O'Neal, which I also remembered. I was like, remember how was there was that one genie movie with Shaquille O'Neal and that other one was Sinbad? And then I'm reading the paper on the Mandela effect. And I'm like, what? That wasn't real? but I remember seeing the trailer for it and I went and looked it up and I was like, oh my God, I thought this movie existed this entire time. And, and I was just incorrectly recalling uh, this memory, you know? Yeah, not Marvel's Shazam. <laughs> no, that's Zach, uh, what's his face? What's, what's his name? Zach, Zach somebody. I can't remember his name. I'm so bad with actors' names, but, but yeah. Oh, right, right. Yeah, yeah, of course. Shazam is DC, not Marvel. Yeah. Um, the bear, yes, yes, exactly. I don't think it's Greek. I, I think I, he's, I think he's Jewish, actually. Zach, you know what? Now I, now I, now I need to, what's that? No, it's not Zach Galifianakis. <laughs> oh, this is really going to bother me. There's no uh, way Zach Galifianakis is in Shazam. The, yeah, no, it's, it's, no way. it's, it's, uh, uh, Zachary, Zachary Levi, Zachary Levi. That's who plays Shazam. Def, completely different guy from Sinbad. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Um, so that's the Mandela effect. Um, uh, so false memory. Um, that's a really cool topic. Uh, and you could do that too. You know, just because someone else wrote a paper on it doesn't mean that you can't also write a paper on it. Um, I had one student write a really interesting paper on the chupacabra. The chupacabra is a sort of South American vampiric uh, beast. Um, and the student wrote a really cool paper uh, explaining that the chupacabra might um, might simply be cases of wild dogs who suffer from mange. You know, you've heard that term, ma mangy dog. Uh, well, mange is a is a is like a disease they can get that affects their skin and their fur and causes uh, all of their fur to fall out and their skin to sort of look scaly. Um, so um, 
Uh, also, I've mentioned Hungry Ghosts. Um, I had a student write a really cool paper on the Hungry Ghost. I've had a lot of students write papers on the djinn, um, which are kind of like a folkloric, not paranormal, but certainly a supernatural folkloric creature. Um, and some students take various approaches. Some will take a paranormal topic and try to naturalize it, right? Try to explain it in naturalistic terms. Others will sort of dive into the history and the folklore and um, the sort of psychology behind why these ideas uh, are maybe common across many cultures uh, through history. And what is it about human beings that make us tell these kinds of stories? Um, uh, so stuff like that. Basically, what you want to be doing is writing an argumentative paper. You can't just be surveying uh, a topic. Uh, you have to engage with a topic critically. Um, and that would be the number one thing that you need to do. And those are a couple of suggestions. Um, another one would be reality shifting. I've, I, I had a student write a really interesting paper on reality shifting trends on TikTok, which are apparently a thing. Um, so uh, yeah, um, really it's, it's quite wide open in terms of the topics you can choose. Uh, it can be anything that's kind of like paranormal, supernatural, or unexplained. Um, and there's a number of different approaches that you can take toward it too. Um, any other questions? Yeah, I actually do have a, a question about uh, the type of a references that I guess we're allowed to use. Okay. Um, are we allowed to use things like novels or short stories if we're trying to get an example from something or is it just about you like research, uh, stuff like that? I think it's okay to use those as long as you let the reader know the kind of example uh, that you're drawing from. So if you want to draw like, uh, you know, I don't know, I guess if you're talking about uh, some particular creature and you want to give the reader an idea of what this creature is like, you could reference how it's described in fiction. So I don't know, maybe if you pick like dragons, you could, uh, you could talk about Beowulf. Uh, you could talk about um, the ring cycle. You could talk about Tolkien or, or something and you could say like, here's all the ways that these people have imagined uh, uh, the dragon uh, thing, right? So yeah, that's fine. Just as long as it's clear what you're doing with that source and why you've picked that source. So I, I suspect that students who pick more folkloric topics will probably need to do this, right? So if you're talking about uh, a, a bit of old lore, you'll definitely want to reference these stories because oftentimes those are the only accounts we have of those, of those creatures, right? So yeah, that would be fine. I would just say use discretion and uh, make sure everything is well explained. Okay, and then to go off of that as well, sorry, I feel like I have so many questions. Um, no worries. <laughs> just to go off of that as well, um, if we were to talk about, like, remember before we were talking about Descartes and his idea of like the, um, the, I think it was like like the animal machine, like the bed's machine or like being like how animals have, don't have souls, humans yeah. do. Um, are we allowed to kind of, I know this is to be like an argumentative or a critical paper. Um, what if, like I was having this idea of we were talking about um, Descartes and because he did talk about humans and like the dichotomy between humans and animals, are we allowed to speculate what he might have thought if something, if my, I don't want to say like, like I have an idea for my topic, but I'm not sure if it's like correct or anything, but um, are we allowed to say anything like a speculating about what he would have thought if, um, if a certain situation arises or is that not I adequate? Think, uh, uh, well, again, I would, I would just kind of, do this with caution and discretion because some of the things that we're talking about here, I mean, uh, Descartes will not have heard of, right? Um, like Descartes might have known about tales of mermaids and giant squid because it was the, you know, it was like the scientific revolution. Um, everyone was going around exploring everything and figuring stuff out. Um, but, of, uh, but there would have been no Bigfoot myth at that time or, or Loch Ness Monster or anything like that. So I think you would have to use discretion there. I would say cautiously speculate, um, but be very careful to distinguish when you're speculating from what we know for certain about what Descartes thought about animals. 
because we do know for certain he thought that they were machines, uh, basically like robots created by God, right? Um, yeah, yeah, like Daniel says, uh, like uh, given that Descartes believed X, he may also have believed or not believed in Y. This is mere speculation, but it is nonetheless plausible or something like that. Um, so so yeah, that's, that's okay to, to write about something like that? I think so. I think so. But 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 just be careful. Just be careful. Remember, this is why I'm having everyone do a proposal so that if I think you're going in a direction that won't be good, I can tell you and I can kind of point you where I think it would be better for you to take your essay, you know, so so that's why we're doing this. Um, so don't okay. worry. I, I wouldn't worry too much about it, you know. Um, yeah. All right. Any any other questions? All right, so maybe what I'll do is open up uh, the quiz and uh, let's go over the answers real quick. I guess I should share my screen again. Um, share screen. Oop. All right, let's go to the quiz. Now, uh, we are getting near the end, so I will have to do this quickly, but I don't think it'll take long. There are only 15 questions after all, so. Oh, what a terrible computer. Okay, week two. I wonder if I can just do the quiz myself and show you the answers that way. Yeah. I can preview the quiz. I could do it that way, yeah. All right. All right. Let's see how good I do at my own quiz. <clears throat> Once it loads. All right, we got 30 minutes. It can be argued that the sense of eeriness we experience when confronted with something uncanny, paranormal, or anomalistic as an emotion. If true, what kind of emotion might eeriness be? Shock, anxiety, or fear? You'll recall from my lectures on the uncanny that I have argued that eeriness is a type of anxiety. And the reason why is because anxiety is an emotion that has to do with uncertainty. And eeriness, I have argued, is an emotion that also has to do with uncertainty. Daniel. This question confused me a bit because I think in the slides you say like and you you describe anxiety as fear of the unknown. Yes, but it's not the same as fear as in fright. It's more specific. And that's why like fear okay. would be a general good guess, but anxiety is specifically uh, what I've argued that this is. Um, for question two. I admit I, I tried to trick you guys with this one looking at the world as if it were alive in the same way as you or I is called animacy, mentalism, mentation, or animism? The answer is animism. Animism is the outlook we have when we look at the world as if it were alive. Animacy is when we perceive that something is alive. I perceive animacy in all of you as I'm looking on the screen. You're all moving around like living creatures. You all seem to have animacy. But animism is that sort of worldview where you look at the world as if it were alive. Um, so the answer is animism. Mentation just means thinking. Mentalism is a type of magic uh, performance. Um, uh, science can only, uh, this, is, uh, this is not where I made my typo. Oh, science can only study natural things like matter and energy. Supernatural things like gods or spirits may exist, but science cannot study them. So what best describes that statement? Is it metaphysical naturalism? 
It's not that because metaphysical naturalism says that none of these things exist. Is it skepticism? Well, it could be, but skepticism really just means doubt, to, to apply doubt in a systematic way. It's methodological naturalism that's our answer because uh, that's what a methodological naturalist would say. Sure, there might be supernatural things, uh, but that's not what science is for. Science is for studying natural things. And natural things are the only things that we can study with science. Parapsychologists often use a deck of 25 cards with five of those containing a cross, five a circle, five a star, five a square, and five with wavy lines in order to study psi abilities. What are these called? Are they tarot cards? Nah, those are the what you do like a tarot reading with. They're, they're not Rhine cards. The Rhines didn't uh, invent these nor are they Psi cards, they are Zener cards. Everything that is, that is paranormal is also supernatural. Yeah, I know, that's false. Because there are some paranormal things that may not be supernatural. We talked about one today, maybe Bigfoot uh, is just an undiscovered species of primate. That would be paranormal, but not supernatural. Maybe there are aliens. Well, they, they're just life forms that exist on other planets. That's not supernatural. It's just a little bit beyond our current scientific understanding, right? So that's why the answer is false. Uh, Jensch and Freud seem to disagree with one another about the role of animacy and animism. This is a tricky one. They disagree about a lot, but do they disagree about this? I don't think they disagree about this at all, uh, except maybe when it comes to Freud's understanding of, uh, of, of the animistic worldview as a worldview that had been surmounted. Uh, but Jensch, although he doesn't use that term, he talks about this worldview the same way. It's a worldview that uh, children easily adopt. It's a worldview that um, you know many earlier societies, like even the ancient Greeks had. Um, so the answer is false. Ernst Jensch believed the main cause of uncanny experiences is the return of the repressed, mental uncertainty, or just paranormal phenomena. Well, it's not the return of the repressed, that's Freud. And paranormal phenomena might be a good guess, but remember, it's mental, or as Jensch said, psychical uncertainty. Have I not saved my other answers? Whoops. Ah. I'm getting some check marks and then I'm getting not check marks. What's what, why is that happening? Am I getting my own questions wrong? No, it, it does that automatically. Oh, it does. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> Restart save. Oh, it's not saved yet. That's why. Oh, that's weird. Okay. So based on what we learned in our intro lecture, what's the biggest challenge parapsychologies face since the Rhines initiated it in the 1930s? Is it replicating results and how difficult that's been? Is it the lack of people with psi abilities that we can recruit to conduct experiments? Or is it really to do with research funding? Well, I never said anything about research funding at all. So you can definitely rule that one out. Lack of people with psi abilities, well, remember, the Rhines didn't look for people with special abilities. They tested everybody. They just said, let's get regular people in and see if any of them have these abilities. So the answer is this one. From which language did the word paranormal enter English? Latin, French, German, or Greek? Anybody remember? Before this, we called it supernormal. But then the word paranormal came from French. So JB and Louisa Ryan studied notable, that is special or exceptional individuals who claim to have psi abilities, false. They did not. Remember, they, they looked at ordinary people. It was the earlier psychical researchers who looked at notable or exceptional cases. Freud believed that the main cause of uncanny experience is return of the repressed. We know it has to be this one, because I already said as much. 
it wasn't mental uncertainty. That was Janssen. Paranormal phenomena, again, would have been a good guess, but it's not specific enough. When we perceive that something is alive or seems to be alive, what are we perceiving? Animacy, life. So animacy is what we perceive. Animism is the sort of outlook or worldview where we look at the world as a, as a place populated by gods, spirits, uh, and uh, other creatures, other, other living, but perhaps supernatural creatures. Oh, another tricky one. From which language did the term parapsychology enter English? Well, it wasn't Greek or Latin. You might have guessed French because that's where paranormal came from. But remember, the Rhines were German and um, the word parapsychology came from the German. This is my typo. <laughs> this is supposed to say metaphysical naturalism. Uh, and that's supposed to be the answer. I, I hope that people realized that this was a typo. Uh, it is naturalism, not naturalism. But yeah, only supernatural things like matter and energy exist. Supernatural things like gods or spirits do not exist. That describes the outlook of a metaphysical naturalist. So what term did paranormal eventually replace? Supernormal. Psychical would have been a good guess. So would supernatural. But remember that it was uh, uh, the, the early um, founders of the uh, Society for Psychical Research, the SPR that originally coined the term supernormal, and that eventually would have been replaced by paranormal, which came from the French. Yeah. Um, just yeah. the, um, the, sorry to interrupt, just like the next time I guess you do the quiz, I think I noticed probably like question one or two, or two, mm -hmm. um, there was a T missing, I think, in naturalism oh. for the other answer. Oh, man, I really got to spell check things more. <laughs> Supernatural okay. things. Oh, you're right. Metaphysical neuralism. <laughs> oh, geez. Okay, so two typos <laughs> I've made. Um, so those should be all the questions. Uh, let me just see. So um, the next, like I said, the next quiz will probably go up tomorrow or, or maybe early on Saturday. Why aren't all my questions saved? Oh, whatever. Uh, and, and I'll keep it open. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> um i'll i'll keep the quiz open for a bit um you know i'll keep it open for like four or five days uh and now that i have the problems with ventus sorted out um i'll be able to get everybody's accommodations locked in programmed in there before we actually begin uh, so hopefully that will save everybody from uh, some headache. Like I said, I know I did have a couple PMC students who contacted me and said, hey, can you just add my extra time or whatever? And I was happy to do that. Uh, and that, that's how I realized Ventus wasn't working. Because I logged on to Ventus and I thought, oh, I don't have any PMC students this term. How strange. And then I started hearing from people. So sorry about that. Um, I'll make sure that all accommodations are in place. Um, uh, and uh, hopefully this didn't um, pose a problem for anybody. So that's all that I have for today. Um, it was kind of fun doing this without slides, I think, but we will go back to using slides next time. Now that I've had a slide break. Next time we're gonna be talking about astrology and horoscopes, and this is gonna be fun. There will not be readings, uh, or there might, there might be some light readings. There will be some viewings. I'm going to upload uh, something fun that I, that I hope everyone will enjoy um, to, uh, to watch uh, about astrology. And then the next class will be uh, aliens and UFOs. And that's also going to be fun because I love space stuff, right? So um, outer space, aliens, fantastic. Um, for that, uh, the reading will be light. Um, I'm going to have you all read the uh, Pentagon report on unidentified aerial phenomena that was declassified uh, a little while ago. And I may even be, a be able to find the European Union's equivalent report because they did one too. It wasn't, um, didn't make as big of a splash in the news, but they also did one. So we'll do that. And then we'll, we'll also watch something else. Uh, you'll want to do the watchings before lecture, of course. Um, 
So yeah, um, next week should be fun. Uh, we'll be very, uh, very light on the readings and very, uh, very fun on the watching. Bob Lazar, is that the guy who says he worked at Area 51 and he saw the aliens or the alien technology? Is that that guy? It is him. Oh, God. Uh, I mean, all right, look. I mean, if you want to hear from Bob Lazar, you can listen to the Joe Rogan whatever, the Joe Rogan Variety Hour, whatever it's called. Actually, I'm just kidding. You should never listen to Joe Rogan because he's actually terrible. Um, uh, but this guy, I, I saw, I, that's where I know him from. I had a friend who was, he was dog sitting for us. We were going to a thing and he came over to dog sit and he's like, I'm just going to watch Rogan. And he had this guy and I was like, what, really? What? Like, oh, oh okay. Uh, so, I mean, I, I guess watch it if you want uh, with a critical eye. Um, I'm, I'm going to have you watch Carl Sagan, actually. I'm just going to come out and say it. I've been throwing a little Carl Sagan breadcrumbs out there. Extraordinary claims, extraordinary evidence. We're going to watch a couple episodes of Cosmos, um, which if you have not seen this, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson did, did like a couple like updated series and they're good. Um, uh, but it's, I mean, but, 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 but Sagan's is just magical. It's just magical um so if you haven't seen it you really need to see some of it uh and 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 gosh darn it i'm gonna make sure that you do so uh yes carl sagan's voice i know right billions and billions it's great um and what a guy still miss carl sagan um so we're gonna talk about yeah. carl sagan and uh we're going to watch uh for Tuesday, A Harmony of the Worlds. That's episode three. Um, and then the Encyclopedia Galactica, which I forget which episode that is. 11, 10 or 11, I think. Um, uh, and, and it'll be fun. We're, and then we'll come together. There'll be a bit of lecture and then a lot of discussion. Anyway, we're way out of time. I got to go. Thank Thanks, you. everybody. Uh, have a good one, and I'll see you next week. Have a good weekend. Bye. You Bye, well. everyone. Thanks. Thank you.